Good morning, everyone. In this video, we will finish our study of trigonometry, so this will be part 7 of that series, but also we will use that knowledge to set up a new coordinate system for the plane called the polar coordinate system, and this will be part 1 in a small unit on that. Okay, so let's get started. Where we ended off in part 6 was that we now know that if we look at this ray, y equals x, where x is positive, coming out of the origin, right, and we look at this other ray, y equals minus x, where again x is positive, any point on the unit circle, z, so modulus is 1, and let's write the point z um, in terms of its coordinates as x comma y. Another way to write that is, of course, x plus iy. So if I have a point Z that satisfies these conditions, the point has to be in the interior of the angle formed by those two rays. So what that means is that, first of all, x has to be positive. Let me write this over here. x has to be positive, and also y has to lie between, strictly, negative x and x. And then also, x squared plus y squared is 1, simply because that's the equation of the unit circle. So that's equivalent to saying that the modulus of z is equal to 1. But those are basically the conditions that the point x comma y has to satisfy to be, in, to be an appropriate point of this type. So you see that the uh, inequality x greater than 0 is just telling you that your point is on the right-hand side of the y-axis. Okay, somewhere to the right of the y-axis. That's this inequality here. Okay, this inequality here, or this, these two inequalities, really, we can also write that equivalently in the form absolute value of y over x is strictly less than 1. Those are just two equivalent formulations of the same thing. Okay, and that's going to... So, yeah, in addition, these two together, if I can join them, right, the conjunction of those two is the set of conditions that tells you that you're in the interior of this angle. Because x positive means that you're on the right-hand side of the y-axis. And then, yeah, this inequality here basically denotes or designates uh, this region and also designates this region here. But the fact that we're on the right-hand side of the y-axis means that we're not looking at that other region. Okay. So anyway, yeah, that's, where the point, that's just telling us where the point z is located. And if z is located on the unit circle and also in the interior of that angle, then we know from part 6 that we can express the point z in the form e to the power i capital A of y over x. And here, capital A is a function of a real variable, which was defined as the sum of a series, power series, this power series involves only odd exponents. So the exponents are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. Okay, the pattern is clear. The signs alternate. Okay, and we uh, talked about the convergence of the series. We know that it converges um, at least for all values of t in the open interval from negative 1 to 1. And that's just by the ratio test. That easily follows by the ratio test. In fact, we're going to look at it in just a minute. Okay, but notice what I'm saying at least. Because that doesn't tell us that the series doesn't converge for other values of t. For example, let's say t is exactly 1. So that's not in this open interval, because in fact it's a boundary point. But there's still some chance that the series might converge when t is equal to 1, and in fact we're going to find that that is indeed true. The series still does converge when t is equal to 1, and the same happens when t is equal to minus 1. But if t is bigger than 1, the series will diverge, and if t is less than negative 1 also, will diverge. Okay, so for now, we, we really only have this function capital A defined on the open interval from minus 1 to 1, and because that's because we used the ratio test in a prior video to prove that for such values of t, the series converges. Okay, anyway, that's going to give the function that eventually we're going to rename this function as the arctangent, arctan function. But I don't want to call it that yet, um, until we've established its properties and fully defined it, because we've really only defined a part of it. Okay, so let me just tell you what I mean by that. The arctan function is going to end up being extended so that its domain is the entire real line. We're going to end up defining a function whose graph looks like this. It's going to be asymptotic to the horizontal line of height pi over 2, and then on the other side, symmetrically, will be asymptotic to the horizontal line at a height of negative pi over 2. But it goes forever in this direction, and also in this direction, so its domain is actually all real numbers. That's the function that ultimately we're going to call arctan. So right now we don't have the full function. What we have is, if this is 1 and this is minus 1, we have a function defined between those two points, strictly. Okay, that's not, not a great picture. Let me fix that. Okay, something like this. We have the function defined just in the open interval, so not exactly at minus 1 and also not exactly at 1, but just everywhere in the middle, strictly between the two. That's the function I'm calling capital A right now. So what we have to do is we have to give it a value at 1 to fill in that blue circle. Okay, and the height of that, the height of that point, or the value of the function at, at that point, is going to turn out to be pi over 4. We don't know that yet. And we also have to give it a value at minus 1, in other words, fill in that circle, and that's going to be height, negative pi over 4. And this picture obviously not very accurate. Because, you know, minus pi over 4 should be exactly midway between height 0 and height minus pi over 2. So midway between these two heights. But my picture is not very accurate, but you get the idea. Okay, so, and then not only do we have to fill in those two circles, we also have to define this portion of the graph, the red, heavy red portion, when t is greater than 1, strictly. And then we also have to define this gold portion of the graph, where, where t is less than minus 1. So that all remains to be done before we can call the function arctan. So for now, we're just calling it capital A. But that's the function that ends up up here in the exponent. And notice what we're plugging into it is the number y over x the ratio y over x, which also has a geometric interpretation. It's the slope of this line. If you join the origin to the point z, uh, the slope of that line is just y over x. <clears throat> you see that because the point, the origin is the point 0, 0, and then z is the point x, y. So you just do the change in y, which is y minus 0, divided by the change in x, which is x minus 0. That gives you y over x as the slope. Okay, so it's really the slope of that line that we're plugging in to the capital A function. But now you see why um, the restriction to that blue region is necessary. By the blue region, I mean like this angle here, the interior of the angle, I mean. Okay, etc. It goes forever um, outward like that. But the restriction to that angle interior 
is necessary because we need this, this inequality right here. We need to have that inequality right there. And the reason I need that is because to plug the value y over x into the function a, to put, put that in the input slot, in other words, right, the thing that we're plugging in has to be in the interval. Has to be in the interval from negative 1 to 1, open. Because that's the domain of the function capital A so far. We have yet to extend its domain to include the point 1. And we have yet to, to extend the domain to include negative 1. And we also have yet to extend the domain to include any value greater than 1 or less than minus 1. So for us right now, the domain is just this open interval here. <clears throat> so in order to, to plug the number y over x into the function a, at least so far, like where we are in the theory right now, at this moment, the value y over x has to be between negative 1 and 1, strictly. In other words, its absolute value has to be less than 1. And that explains the need for this inequality. So that explains the reason for restricting the point z to be within the blue region there, the blue shaded region. Okay, so um, notice that the slope of this line, which is y over x, is computable immediately once you're given the point z. If, if I specify the point z, it means I have to tell you its coordinates. And once you know its coordinates, you can just take the second coordinate and divide it by the first one. So it's clear you know how to find this value, and then you're just going to plug that into the capital A function by essentially forming this series here. And you can calculate that uh, accurately, although not exactly. The way you calculate a series accurately is by adding up a very large number of initial terms. In other words, you take some partial sum with a large number of terms, and that will give an you know, accurate approximation to that quantity. And you can make it more and more and more accurate by taking more and more and more terms. You're never going to get the exact value, perhaps, but you can get as close as you like, at least in principle. Okay, um, so the number here in this position is like is the theta in the general form, e to the i theta. So, and that's the angle in radians. Right? That's the, sort of the angle along the circle. Um, okay, what I just said doesn't really make much sense. Let me fix what I just said. Okay, remember from a prior video that if we look at the point e to the i theta, where theta is just some real number, it's on the unit circle. That's one of the theorems we proved uh, previously, is that this equation is always true. The absolute value or modulus of that point. The point is a complex number, so it's a point in the plane. But it's of absolute value 1. So the distance to the origin is 1, and therefore it's on the unit circle. Anyway, but um, we can then look at this point 1, which is also on the unit circle. And it turns out that the arc length along the circle, starting at 1 and going toward that point, ending at that point, that arc length is essentially the absolute value of theta. The reason I say essentially is because um, theta might be very large, and the absolute value of theta could be some very, very large positive number, which means that we might have to wind around the circle many times before stopping. So for example, if theta is, let's say, 7 pi, let's say theta is 7 pi, right? So since that's positive, that's the same as the absolute value. What that would mean is that you'd have to wind around the circle once to get a 2 pi, another wind gets you up to 4 pi, a third wind gets you up to 6 pi, and then you go from there by pi units, or one semicircle. And so the point e to the i times 7 pi is here. It's, in fact, it's exactly the point negative 1. It's sort of the leftmost point on the unit circle. And we can also write that as just simply e to the i pi. Okay? e to the i pi would just be half a wind. Instead of doing uh, three full winds and then one half of a wind, we could have just done one half of a wind to begin with, one semicircle, which would be, you know, angle of measure pi, 180 degrees. Anyway, so, so with that understanding, the arc length is just the absolute value of theta. So actually, the accurate way to write it would be to take the absolute value of theta and then subtract away from it the largest multiple of 2 pi, less than or equal to it, so that you're getting rid of those extra winds if you need to. So what's the largest multiple of 2 pi, integer multiple of 2 pi, less than or equal to that number? So I did this in a prior video, I'll just remind you that it's, it's simply 2 pi uh, times an integer, and that integer is going to be the floor of absolute theta over 2 pi. That's going to give the correct arc length. So that's sort of the relationship between this point of this form and then the length, the actual length of the arc. Those two are related in this way. Okay, this has theta as the exponent, essentially, well, multiplied by i, of course. So it literally has i theta as the exponent. And then this is some function of theta. It's a kind of fancy function of theta, involving the absolute value and the floor function and various 2 pi factors. But it's just some, basically some function of theta. But they, they, those two are related to each other in the, in the following way. That if you measure the arc length, the length of the arc, from 1 to the point e to the i theta, the exact length of that arc will be given by the expression in this big blue box here. We call it L for arc length. So that's all some stuff we've you know, established previously. But anyway, so coming back here, this, this number a of y over x is the theta value, which, is, which gives the angle measure. Well, you, you have to correct it by subtracting off the largest multiple of 2 pi uh, that is less than or equal to it, but something like that. Oh yeah, so wh why am I calling it the angle measure? It's, it's really an arc length. But you see, that's all angle measure is. By definition, this um, arc length L is also called the measure of this angle in radians. That's the definition of the radian measure system, is that by definition, the measure of an angle with its initial ray being the positive x-axis Right? And then it has a terminal ray, which is this one here. The uh, radian measure of that angle is simply the length of the corresponding arc. So L, by definition. And we use the word radians just to, to symbolize not really a system of units so much. It's not like a physical dimension, like centimeters or you know, kilograms. It's not a physical dimension. What it is is just a signifier that we're using that number as an angle measure rather than as a length. We're using it to speak of an angle, the size of an angle, rather than to speak of you know, the measure of a line segment or anything else. So you should really interpret the word radians that way. It doesn't really need to be said. The only, it's a matter of emphasis. We say the word radians just for, to emphasize the fact that we're talking about an angle measure rather than an arc length. But really, the two are exactly the same thing, by definition. All right, good. So that's the theory we've got so far. 
That's sort of a brief summary, well, a 20-minute summary of um, everything that we've achieved so far. And all this stuff has been proven rigorously. Okay. By the way, I should also remind you of the connection. Like, where are the trig functions here? In, in the 20 minutes I've been speaking so far, I haven't explicitly written down any trig functions. But you see, the trig functions are just hidden in e to the i theta. Because, you know, that, the cosine of theta is just the real part, or x-coordinate of that. And then the sine of theta is the imaginary part, or y-coordinate. Another way to write this is that this is cos theta plus i times sine theta. Um, and by the way, I should also tell you that there's a common notation for this, which you'll see in a lot of books, which is the notation cis theta. This is in your book, for example, your pre-calculus textbook. Now, granted, I've never used, I've never even referred to your textbook until now. Um, but a lot of books use this, so it's good to be aware. Right? Um, so what does CIS stand for? It's actually a pretty clever notation. CIS, or cis, is shorthand for cosine plus i times sine. And you're just plugging theta into that. So that plugs the theta into the cosine, and also simultaneously plugs the theta into the sine. And then you get the expression cos theta plus i sine theta. So cis theta is just a short way to write that. And just understand that cis is kind of like a compound, um, it's an acronym. And it really stands for this, cosine and then i times sine. Well, in full, it would be cosine plus i times sine, something like that. Okay, this is simply Euler's formula. We spoke about extensively. So that's where the trig functions are. They're just hidden in this very compact short notation, e to the i theta. They appear as the real part and the imaginary part, or the two coordinates. All right, so like this, this point here on the unit circle, in traditional books, would be written as cos theta, comma, sine theta. All right, good. So now, how do we finish? Well, first of all, what, what, do, what exactly do we need to finish? Other than filling out all the remaining cases in the definition of arc time, what, what really is our goal? So our goal is just to remove the restriction that z has to belong to that blue region. I want to be able to do the same thing for any point z on the unit circle. If I'm given some totally arbitrary point z on the unit circle, I would still like to be able to write z in the form e to the i theta, where theta is real. But the question is, how do I find that theta? So I was able to find such a theta um, in the case when z was over here. Right, the theta that we found happens to be capital A of y over x. So that works um, in this case, right? It works just when z is in this configuration, in the blue region. But that same formula is not going to work when z is over here, outside of that blue region. So we're, in that case, we're going to need a different formula for theta. And that's really our main goal, is to find such a formula that works elsewhere on the unit circle. Right? So let me outline the main steps for you. The way it's going to go is, is as follows. So we have these two special points, i and negative i, which are like the top and bottom points. This is a special point 1. And then we have these two special points here, um, which are kind of 45 degrees removed. So this is the ray y equals x, where x is positive. And this is y equals negative x, where x is positive. Okay? So those are like the same two familiar rays from before. So um, where we've defined things so far is on this red arc, everywhere on this red arc, including at 1. But not at the two, not at these two points here, the two endpoints. So if z is anywhere on this red arc, but again, it's an open-ended arc, open-ended because it doesn't include its two endpoints. So that is fully done. Right? If z is on that open-ended arc, we know we can write z in the form e to the i theta, where theta is capital A of y over x. And that's certainly a real number because the series for A will converge. And the reason it converges is because the value being plugged into it is of absolute value less than 1. So it's going to be some well-defined real number, and it's going to satisfy this equation. Okay, which essentially means that we're writing z, let's say z is here, right? we're writing z in the form cosine theta, comma sine theta, where theta is something that we know, some, theta is something we can calculate. And to be very, very, very explicit about it, the way you calculate theta is by taking the number y over x and just treating it as the t in the uh, formula for the series. And you can calculate that you know, out to a very large number of terms and get a very, very close approximation to theta that you can make as close as you please by taking more and more and more terms. So theta is computable in that sense. Okay, good. Now, the way it's going to go is like this. Step one is that we need to fill in this circle here. Fill in that blue circle. And when I say fill in, what I mean is that if z happens to be exactly that point, and that point has known coordinates, it's easy to calculate. You can use the equation of the unit circle. Remember, the equation of the unit circle is just x squared plus y squared equals 1. And then you can just set y equal to x. In, in that equation, you have to set y equals x because that's the line that that point is on. And you also have to set x positive because that's the ray or half line that that point is on. And from these three conditions, it's easy to solve for x. You see, you'll see that x is exactly um, 1 over the square root of 2. Or you can rationalize the denominator and write it as root 2 over 2. That's the x, and then the y is equal to that x, because we have this equation, y equals x. So yeah, both the x and the y are the same, root 2 over 2. So that's like this special point that's at 45 degrees from the positive x direction. And what, I what we have to do with it is we have to write it in the form e to the i times something, some real number. The question is what, what real number goes in there? And what we're going to prove is that pi over 4 goes in there. That shouldn't be very surprising, because pi over 4 is supposed to be equivalent to 45 degrees. The way we define the degree function, let me just remind you, that the way we define the degree function, if x is some real number, is that we um, put, we just multiply x by this constant. So if I put in 45 into the degree function, you know, I do that wrong every time. <laughs> Sorry. At least I catch myself. Okay, it's, it's that constant. So yeah, it's like pi times 45 over 180. And you can see that the 45 will cancel with 180, leaving a 4 in the bottom. So, now of course, that doesn't tell us that that's the correct value, because, you know, we don't really know that this is 45 degrees. We, we only know that from prior um, mathematics that we've been taught. We've only been told that. We haven't really proved it yet. And actually, proving this equation here, like establishing this equation in the green box, is exactly equivalent to establishing that this is a 45 degree angle. Because 45 degrees is indeed pi over 4 in radians. 
And so what this says is that the angle, which is after all just the exponent or the, the coefficient of i in the exponent, the theta, that angle can be taken as pi over 4 and you will reach that point. You will reach the point whose coordinates are root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. So, but we haven't established this equation yet. In doing so, we will, we will establish that this is a 45 degree angle. In other words, an angle of exactly pi over 4 radians. But we haven't really done it yet. So let me just erase that for now. Okay, so that's step one, is to fill in that, that blue circle by proving this claim. Okay, step two, we're doing gray. That's going to be to fill in this circle. And that's very, very similar to step one, so not a big deal. This, this point here just turns out to be root 2 over 2 minus i times root 2 over 2. It's the complex conjugate of this other point. You can see that they're reflections of each other across the x-axis. So it's just a conjugate where you negate the y-coordinate, you negate the imaginary part. And that is going to turn out to have an angle of negative pi over 4. In other words, the theta that works, the theta that makes this e to the i theta, is minus pi over 4. But again, that's something we have to establish. It's not something obvious. So that, that's what I mean by step 2. Okay, then step 3 is going to be to um, fill in this arc here. Again, open-ended. So what I mean by fill in, again, is um, just for any point on that set, we want to express it in the form e to the i theta, where theta is real. And we're, we're going to do that in the following way. What we're going to end up doing is just taking a point here, let's say on this arc, and reflecting it across the diagonal line. So you see, if I do that, then I get a point on the red arc. And I know how to, fi I know how to find the angle for that point on the red arc. In other words, this point here. I know how to find its angle. When I say find its angle, I just mean express it in the form e to the i theta. And then based on that knowledge, I can go back to the original point and express it in the form e to the i something. e to the i times something. Okay, but what the something is, we'll have to work out. And that's going to take care of that little arc. Right, so that's going to be step three. Step four is going to be to take care of this arc here. Okay, and that's very similar to step three, so not a big deal. Step five is going to be to fill in this little circle here. In other words, to express i in the form e to the i times something. And that's something that's going to turn out to be uh, just pi over two. But again, we have to establish that. So let me call that step five. Uh, <coughs> I'm running out of colors here, I'm just repeating colors. So yeah, then we're going to fill in that lower circle, the point negative i, and express that in the form e to the minus i times pi over two. Again, that's very similar to the, the case of i itself. Let me call that step six. <coughs> okay, and then the final step in the whole thing is to deal with this left-hand arc. Let me do, do in gray. This whole entire left-hand semicircle is going to be the last step. So let me call that step seven. And the way we're going to deal with that is um, also by some sort of a transformation, right? If I have a point, let's say, over here, what I'm going to end up doing is considering its point reflection through the origin to get it onto that red arc. The reason for that is because I know how to deal with points on the red arc. I know how to express them in the form e to the i theta. Okay, and that will allow me to express this point here in the form e to the i times something. And that will take care of the entire unit circle, and then we're going to put it all together and come up with a formula that works for any z. It gives the appropriate theta for any z. Okay, that formula is called the principal argument of z. But it's going to be defined in many cases, depending on, like, you can see the cases actually in this picture, basically here. All the different steps in this process will give the cases in the definition of the uh, principal argument. All right, so um, that's kind of an outline of what we want to achieve. So let's get started with the details. Okay, the first thing to do is um, to talk about pi over 4 and this point, right, root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2, or if we write it as a complex number. Right, we want to prove that this is, and again, I have to mark it with a question mark for now, e to the i times pi over 4. Right? Now that's in itself not too difficult. It's really not that hard to, to prove that. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Because we also would like to know that if I take a point on the unit circle very close to that, but on the red arc, see, like, what if I, what if I consider this heavy black point here? That's on the red arc, so it has already an angle associated with it, namely this. Right? And then I allow that point to kind of creep along the circle, moving toward that blue point. See, what if I take this heavy black point here, and just allow it to move a little bit upwards to approach that blue point? As that happens, the slope of this line, which remember is just simply y over x, is going to approach plus infinity. No, I'm sorry, of course not. It's going to approach 1. And so the slope of this blue line here is going to approach 1, which is the slope of the, this ray um, right here. Okay, let me actually mark this right here. This ray has a slope of 1. So if I allow y over x to approach the value 1, then this point right here will move toward this special point, which is marked in blue, right in the picture. And what I'd like to know then is that the angle associated with that point, which is a of y over x, that should approach this angle, pi over 4, as the ratio y over x gets closer and closer to 1 from below. Essentially, something like that is what we want to prove. It's not just that pi over 4 is like an angle that works for this point, because there are many angles that work for that point. You can always add 2 pi. Right? I can always take, let's say pi over 4 works, but I can just take that and add 2 pi, and I'll get another, another value that works. Or I can subtract 2 pi, or I can add 4 pi. Or I can add, you know, whatever, 6 pi, any multiple of 2 pi. And I'll still get a number that works. But what makes pi over 4 unique is that it's actually the limit of these angles, which were the angles associated with the red case, the red open in the dark, initially. Right? You see that the angle associated with that case is this, given by this formula. So the limit of that formula, as the slope approaches 1 from below, is just exactly pi over 4. That's really what we want. Right? So both, like, this fact by itself is not very difficult to prove, because it only deals with that one point. It doesn't de deal with the question of any limit as we approach that point. It just deals with what happens at that point itself. And it's equivalent to saying, by the way, like this claim is equivalent to just saying that the cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, because that's the x-coordinate, is the cosine. Um, remember, after all, that this e to the i times an angle is just cos theta, 
comma sine theta. So if this questioned equation is actually true, if that questioned equation actually turns out to be true, then it will also follow that the x-coordinate is equal to the x-coordinate, right? and the y-coordinate equals the y-coordinate. So these are equivalent to these two claims, that the cosine of 5 over 4 is root 2 over 2, and also the sine of 5 over 4 is root 2 over 2. Again, we haven't established those, but that's basically what this boils down to. And you see, those are easy things to establish just by using like double-angle formulas and half-angle formulas. But we'll do it in a moment. But you see, uh, this is a different story here, because this claim deals with not just what happens at that very point, at this special point, but what happens as you approach that point. So it connects two of the cases, right? It connects like case, um, well, I guess case zero, which is like the red arc that we've already dealt with. We call that case zero, um, right? It's like a matter of connecting case zero with case one, which is that, that blue point, this special point right here. Okay, anyway, so let's, um, let's get to it. Okay, so first we can just, you know, prove this claim here. And I'm not going to do the whole thing because it's a bit lengthy, but I'll just kind of sketch you know, what, what the process looks like. So, yeah, the idea is that we can start with the fact that sine of pi is zero and cosine of pi is minus one. Uh, we know those from a prior video. And then we can try to look at pi over two. So the way you yeah, deal with this is like you, you use double angle formulas. So let's look at two times pi over two. So on the one hand, that's just sine of pi, which is zero. But on the other hand, that's two sine pi over two, cosine pi over two. Right. But we also know that we can look at cosine of two times pi over two. In other words, cosine of pi, that's minus one. But it's also like two times the cosine squared of pi over two minus one. That's one of the three double angle formulas for the cosine. Right. So working from that, um, if you set this equal to minus one, and you can then add one to both sides to cancel those out, and then you'll divide through by 2. You find that cosine squared of pi over 2 is 0, and that just means that the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So let me keep track on the side of what, we've, what we're establishing right now. Now you see, once we know that, then this factor here is known to be 0. Um, does that help us with sine of pi over 2? Okay, that doesn't really help us with sine of pi over 2, though. Because this equation will now just say 0 equals 0, which is true for any value. Right, but actually, we don't, we don't need that to get sine of pi over 2, because we know the Pythagorean relation. So we know that sine squared of pi over 2 will be 1 minus cosine squared. Now, cosine squared of pi over 2 is 0, so this actually will just be a 1, which tells us that sine of pi over 2 is either plus or minus. Sine of pi over 2 is plus or minus radical 1, in other words, plus or minus 1. But which is it? Is it plus 1 or minus 1? And the answer is it's plus 1. And that's because we established in a previous video that the sine function is actually strictly positive on the interval from 0 to pi. Okay? It's strictly positive heights everywhere between 0 and pi. Of course, at 0, the height is 0, and at pi, the height is 0. But in the middle, on the open interval 0 to pi, the heights are strictly positive. So since pi over 2 is in that interval, in fact, it's the midpoint of that interval, the sine function can't take a negative value there. So it can't be minus 1. This, this plus minus sign here can't be minus 1. So it has to be a positive 1. Right? So that establishes the values of cosine and sine for the angle pi over 2. And then we can just go through this process again, uh, one more time, again, just using double angle formulas to get the values at pi over 4. Okay? Um, for example, with the cosine, we'll take 2 times pi over 4, which is simply pi over 2. We know that that's 0. On the other hand, we have 2 cosine squared of the half angle minus 1. Okay, so this is equal to 0 from here. We can add the 1 over and, and divide by 2. I can see this, and then you can take square roots. So cosine of pi over 4 is like either plus or minus uh, the square root of a half, which rationalizes that way. So we still have to decide, though, if it's plus or minus. Okay, and that's a fairly easy thing to do if you remember the definition of cosine as a series. Okay, it's, it's pretty easy to establish that this function is positive, like cos theta is positive, when theta is between 0 and something, like 1, for instance, certainly. Okay, how, how would you do that? Well, you can consider the terms in groups of two, right? Like this first group would certainly be positive if theta is between zero and one, because theta squared will be less than one, and then theta squared over two will be less than a half. And it's obviously positive because theta is positive. So then one minus that is bigger than one minus a half. In other words, it's bigger than a half, so certainly it's positive. And then you'll look at the next group of two, and you'll see that that's also positive. So essentially, it's just a sum of positive terms. It's an infinite sum of positive terms, but yeah, its value is strictly positive. So that's the correct theorem. And notice that um, pi over four is indeed less than one, positive and less than one. And pi over four is an acceptable value of theta in this range. So this must be true. But the co its cosine must be positive. Now, how do I know that it's in that range though? Okay, well, that's equivalent to saying that pi is between 0 and 4. And in fact, we know something better than that. We know that pi is actually between 2 and 4. Because if you remember the way we set things up, we proved that the sine function takes a positive height at 2 and then a negative height at 4. And then we said that pi is like the leftmost root between those two, between 2 and 4. So in fact, we know a better inequality. We know that pi is between 2 and 4, strictly. So certainly it's between 0 and 4. Right? So we, we know these. And therefore, by this little lemma that we just proved, we can say that the cosine of pi over 4 must be positive. So this sign here must be a plus sign. And that establishes that cosine of pi over 4 is plus root 2 over 2. And a very similar argument will prove that the sine is also. In fact, you can just use the Pythagorean relation. The sum of the squares of these two has to equal 1. And plus we know that the sine function is strictly positive everywhere between 0 and pi. And pi over 4 is certainly between 0 and pi. So the sine of pi over 4 has to be positive. And then from sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, we can use the previously established value of cosine to find the value of sine. Okay, so notice also that this tells us that the tangent of pi over 4 is exactly 1. 
What I mean by tangent is just tan theta is by definition sine theta over cosine theta, provided cosine theta is not zero. In other words, provided theta is not pi over 2 plus pi times an integer. It's easy to prove that these give the roots of cosine. Those are all the roots of the cosine function. So as long as theta is not one of those, then you can divide by cos theta, because you're not dividing by zero. So that's going to tell us like the values of theta for which the tangent is, is meaningful. So that's the definition of tangent. Um, by the way, um, proving that these are all the roots of cosine is a little challenging, so I should just say a word or two about it. It's, it's pretty easy to show that those are roots of cosine. All of those are roots of cosine. Um, if I plug them in, like let's say I have pi times n, where n is an integer. So you'll get cos pi over 2 sine of pi times n. Oh, I'm sorry, cosine. And then minus sine sine. Okay. Now we've established that this is 1. And we also know that this is 0, because the roots of, of sine are just exactly the multiples of pi. Yeah, I, I really should talk about that for a second. That's like an important piece of knowledge. I claim that the roots of the sine function are just exactly the multiples of pi. That's not entirely obvious, so I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. But the nice thing is that this is 0. So this whole term here zeroes out. And now you see that everything, it's just 0 minus 0. So that does establish that all of those values are roots of cosine. But why are they the only roots? Why can't cosine have any other roots besides those? All right, so let's, let me just take a minute to kind of explain to you why all the roots of, of sine are the set pi z, that is all the integer multiples of pi. So you'll remember that the sine function takes the value 0 exactly at 0, and then again at pi, and nowhere in between. There are no roots in here. The reason for that is because pi is by definition the smallest positive root of sine. Okay. Now what about between 0 and 2 pi? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a symmetry. See, the sine curve has this kind of symmetry, which is going to tell us that there's also no roots in here. Okay. And the symmetry I mean is this. You can easily show that sine of theta plus pi is equal to minus sine of theta. Just follow from the addition rule, because you're going to get like sine of the first, cosine of the second, plus cosine of the first, sine of the second. Now notice that this is 0, so this whole term zeroes out. Cosine of pi is minus 1, so the whole thing becomes negative 1 times sine theta, which gives you this rule here. So you see that if I had some root in here, between pi and 2 pi, by subtracting pi from it, I could get back to something here. Let's say I had some root, let me call it rho temporarily, so sine of rho is 0. Well, then I'm going to consider the point rho minus pi, which is going to be between 0 and pi, if the original rho was between pi and 2 pi. And I'll just subtract the pi from everything. Okay. Anyway, so um, if I take this theta to be rho minus pi on both sides, then you see that um, I'm still adding pi to this. So that's going to be sine of rho, like this whole side of the equation. And I'm assuming that that's 0, because rho is supposed to be a root. So that side of the equation is 0, but that means that this side of the equation is also 0. So that means rho minus pi is also a root. But we know that already that there are no roots in here. So rho minus pi cannot, cannot exist, and therefore this rho cannot exist. So that, that establishes that there are no roots in there. Okay. But you see, that's one full period of the sine function. The rest of the graph is just a repetition of that shape. So once we understand the shape of the graph in one full period, then we understand the shape everywhere. So you see what the roots are. The roots are 0, pi, and 2 pi, and then there's going to be 3 pi and 4 pi, right? And then this side there's like minus pi and minus 2 pi. You get exactly the integer multiples of pi. And those are all the roots there are, because there are no roots anywhere in the middle. There are no roots in here, and there are also no roots in here, and none in there, and none in there, and so on. So we've established like all the roots. Okay, well, in a very similar way, we can establish all the roots of cosine, because it turns out that the cosine graph is just a shift of the sine graph. It's like a horizontal shift. Okay, the um, thing I have in mind is the fact that the cosine of pi over 2 plus theta, let's work this out using the addition rule. Okay, we know that uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1. Yeah, so I guess I need, I need minus theta, of course. So that this becomes a plus. Right? Also, cosine of pi over 2 we established already is 0. So that means that this whole term 0 is out. You see what you end up with is just the sine. So the way that you can make cosine equal to 0, the only way to do it, the only way to make this side of the equation equal to 0 is by making this side of the equation equal to 0. And we know exactly when that happens. This happens if and only if theta is a multiple of pi, where n is an integer. So that means that the only inputs to the cosine, which will make the cosine have the value 0, are things of the form pi over 2 minus a multiple of pi. And now, I said pi over 2 plus a multiple of pi, but those are the same because the n can be replaced with negative n, since it's just an arbitrary integer. And so that establishes that, that those are all the roots of the cosine. Okay, anyway, that was just a little tangent, if you'll forgive the pun. But that's, the, that's the tangent function, and we've now established that the tangent of pi over 4 is 1, simply because the sine and cosine of pi over 4 are the same. So we're just dividing that number by itself. Okay, good. So, um, coming back all the way to this issue, like we have now established these two claims, and therefore we've established this. So we know that pi over 4 is like a good angle measure, a good median measure for that special point on the unit circle. But we still have not done this. Okay. So let me just try to briefly explain how that's going to work. All right, the idea is going to be, we're going to try to establish a series of lemmas, or steps. Okay, the first of which is going to be that the series we get by taking the arctan series, right? Take that series that we're used to, which was capital A of t, and just plug into it t equals 1, which previously we were not allowed to do. So I know I'm introducing a new notation here, which is that if I have some function of t, and I write this, that's just an alternative way of saying you plug in 1. Okay, so in other words, 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh. We want to prove that this converges in the reals. So it has some finite value. And we're going to temporarily call that value alpha. Now that alpha is going to turn out to be pi over 4. So it turns out. We don't know this yet. 
that alpha is pi over 4. That's part of what we want to establish. So let me put this in brackets. When we, when we prove that, that's going to be a very, very cool fact, because it also yields as a corollary. Again, we don't know this yet. But as a corollary, we're going to get this equation for pi. You see, pi over 4 is going to be this alpha, which is the sum of this series. And if you multiply that through by 4, right, multiply every term on both sides by 4, it tells you that pi can be written as 4 minus 4 thirds plus 4 fifths minus 4 sevenths plus 4 ninths minus 4 elevenths, and so on and so on. It gives, in other words, a series of specific numbers that, that sums to pi. And that is the long sought after computational formula for pi. If you recall, we, when we introduced pi, we introduced it, introduced it in a very abstract way. We just said that it's like the least positive root of the sine function. We didn't give any value of it, or any procedure for calculating or estimating its value. Well, this is the thing we were looking for. This will give a procedure for computing pi to any accuracy you like. And now I should mention that it's not a, not a great algorithm for computing pi because it's pretty slow to converge. And the reason is because the, sum, the terms alternate in sine. So you keep sort of overshooting pi and then undershooting it repeatedly. And it only converges to pi quite slowly. There are much better um, algorithms for computing pi that converge to the true value much, much faster in fewer steps. But those all require calculus to understand. But here we have at least some, some available algorithm. By taking a partial sum with many, many terms, we can get you know, a, good, a good approximation to pi. OK, anyway, um, that's going to follow right, as a corollary from this equation here. Because alpha, after all, is just the sum of this series. And then again, you just multiply through by 4, and you'll have this. And so that's one thing we want to do is to prove the convergence of that um, series. But another thing I need to do is show that um, if I allow t to get very close to 1 from below, then a of t converges to a of 1, which is alpha. Notice that a of, this is just a of 1. It's the function a of t with t equal to 1, or a of 1 is another way of writing that. So alpha is just a synonym for a of 1. Oh, except, OK, I'm slightly jumping ahead of myself here. Remember that a of 1 didn't really have a value. We only gave capital A a value when t was a number strictly between minus 1 and 1. But you see that we can give it this value if we know that the series converges. Because this is the value at t, where t is between negative 1 and 1, if the same exact series converges when t is equal to 1, that would be a natural value to give the function. So in other words, we're just defining this now. We're defining a of 1 as the sum of this series, which is a very natural way to define it. Okay? So when I use this quantity a of 1, I don't mean to use it as if it exists already. What I mean to do is just to define it. I'm going to define it as the sum of that series, provided that series converges. But we have to check that the series does converge. That has to be checked you know, independently. Okay, but anyway, this is going to be true, that if I allow t to approach 1 from below, the reason I need to approach 1 from below is just because the only t, t values for which the function a of t makes any sense are values t in here. So I can let t get very close to 1, but it has to go, do so from below. And that's what this upper minus sign means. So t is less than 1, and then the distance 1 minus t is going to go to 0. And then I want to prove that this quantity can be made arbitrarily close to this one. Okay. Also, we're going to show that for values of t strictly between minus 1 and 1, if I take the tangent of the function a of t, it just returns t. So that's a true identity, at least on this open interval here. All right, also, we're going to show that the tangent of a of 1 is 1. Let's recall that the tangent of pi over 4 is also 1. We've already established that fact. So this quantity a of 1, which is also otherwise known as alpha, also has a tangent equal to 1. So we need to prove that. All right, and then finally, what's step number 9 through step 5? We're going to show that. Um, Let's see, pi over 4 is certainly between these two values, so that's nothing. We, uh, that's obviously true. But we need to show also that the alpha, or a of 1, also is in that same range. Okay, so that's a question. And what we are going to show about that range is that the tangent function is strictly increasing on that open interval, from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Strictly increasing function. And what that tells us is that um, it never takes the same height twice. Let me just draw you a graph. If I look between pi over 2 um, and minus pi over 2, the tangent function is a strictly increasing function. It has these vertical asymptotes. And so it never takes the same height twice. There's, you can't find two distinct points where the function takes the same height. So what that means is that since both of my values, pi over 4 and a of 1, they're both in that interval, like they're both, they both, both fall between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and they have the same tangent, namely 1, it's going to follow that the two of them must be equal. Okay, this is going to follow as the conclusion. Right? Because they can't possibly be different. If they were different, let's say that here's pi over 4 and here's a of 1, if they were different, then their tangent heights, their tangent values would be different. They couldn't possibly have the same tangent value because of the strict, strictly increasing nature of that function. Okay, so once we go through this five-step process, then we will have fully established this claim here. Right? Because if I allow y over x, the slope of that line, which let's just call t for short, right? if I allow that to approach 1 from below, then a of t, we know, is going to approach a of 1, and a of 1, we just proved, or we will have proved, is pi over 4. So that will fully establish that convergence claim. And remember, back in this picture, what it's going to tell us is that um, as the slope of this blue line here gets closer and closer to 1, the angle to the positive x-axis, it's going to get closer and closer to pi over 4. So it's a kind of continuity property. The, the, the exact value of the angle on that diagonal line, on the black ray, is precisely what we expect it to be. Namely, the limit of the angle as you approach that. As you approach that ray. Okay, anyway, that's going to totally take care of all the math behind you know, this case that I labeled 1. 
And the case I labeled 2 is very similar to that. So I'm not going to bother talking about that case really at all. It's literally the same steps work exactly the same way. The only difference is that we're now below the x-axis instead of above the x-axis. And the slope is approaching minus 1 rather than 1. Okay. Oh, by the way, I should point out something I, I kind of neglected to mention. Um, is that the function a of t is an odd function on its initial domain. In other words, a of negative t equals minus a of t. And that's actually a very simple thing to prove. It's just that if you look at the formula for a of t, the key observation is just that only odd powers are used. Only odd exponents are used. So if you replace t with negative t, you see that every term is going to negate. You're going to have like minus t cubed over 3, but the minus inside the cubing is going to come out and just negate that whole term. Then the minus inside the fifth power is going to come out. And so you see what this, this is just the negative of the original series. In other words, the negative of the original a of t. So it's clearly an odd function. Now, knowing that this is going to be the arctan, this is perhaps not terribly surprising because the tangent is also an odd function. That's because it's an odd function over an even function. That's always true. Either. If you take an odd function and either multiply or divide by an even function, you always get an odd function. Whereas the product of two even functions is even, or the ratio. And perhaps a bit surprisingly, the product or the ratio of two odd functions is, is then even. But anyway, you, you see like what happens if, if I replace theta with minus theta, top and bottom. The minus comes through on top, but just goes away on the bottom. So you end up with an overall minus. And this tells you that the tan of negative theta is minus the tan of theta. So because arctan is going to be a kind of inverse to the tangent, it's not terribly surprising that if one of them is odd, so is the other. But we don't actually know that yet. So we have to sort of prove them, prove the two claims in their own terms. But fortunately, they're both very easy to prove. All right, so let's try to go back and just back up some of these steps and you know, justify some of these steps. Okay, I'm not going to do it in great detail because it was already quite long. But um, basically, the way I'm going to prove the convergence of the series is by grouping by twos, kind of a common you know, technique. If you group by twos, the, the terms then become all positives. It's easy to see that. But of course, that doesn't prove it converges because the sum of positive terms could uh, get infinitely large as you keep adding more and more. We can, we can prove by comparison that it converges by using the comparison test. Uh, let me show you how that, how that looks. So the first group just works out to be, like if you put them over a common denominator, 3 minus 1 over 1 times 3. The next one would be 7 minus 5 over 5 times 7. 11 minus 9 over 9 times 11. 15 minus 13 over 13 times 15. Okay. You notice that all the numerators are 2. Every numerator is equal to 2. So we can just factor that out. And what I'm going to do now is I'll create a term-by-term -term greater series. Just ignoring the factor of 2. I'll leave the factor of 2 alone. But I can create like a series that's greater term-by-term -term by making all the denominators smaller. Every denominator is going to be made smaller, but the tops are going to be kept the same. When you keep the numerators the same, but you make all the denominators smaller, then you make the fractions themselves bigger. So I'm getting a term-by-term -term larger series. Okay, so like I'll reduce this 3 to a 1. I'll also reduce 5 and 7 both to 2s. I'll reduce um, 9 and 11 to 3s, a pair of 3s, and so on. So that series is certainly bigger. But notice that that's just the Basel series. That's like Euler's Basel series. It's 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared. It's the sum of the reciprocals of the perfect squares. And we know that that's finite. So therefore, this whole thing is finite. So that, that proves the convergence of that series. Okay. Uh, what else did I want to say about this? Yeah, no, that's fine. Oh, also, it converges to a positive value. It's clearly because this is already the sum of positive terms. And then you're just multiplying it by 2, which is positive. So obviously, this series is finite in value, but also it has a positive value. So the sum of the series, which I called alpha before, exists, and it's also strictly positive. So just, I'll just make a note here. This alpha exists, like it's the true sum of the series, and it's a finite real number. And it's also, in fact, a positive real number. Okay, good. So now, yeah, let's, okay, right, let's work on step number two, which says this, that if I let the value of t be in here somewhere and just be approaching one from below, then the value of a of t, which is this series, right, it should be getting closer and closer to the value of this series, one minus a third plus a fifth. That's not very obvious, because although each term is approaching the appropriate limit, like this t is going to be approaching this one, and then negative a third t cubed should be approaching negative a third, and a fifth t to the fifth will be approaching that, but there's infinitely many terms, so, you know, things get a little bit wonky when you have infinitely many terms. Now, you've already seen a theorem, in fact, you've seen it many times now, that allows you to deal with a limit process where you have a series. You, you take a limit sign and you pass it inside. That's the dominated convergence. But unfortunately, the dominated convergence theorem just doesn't apply to this situation. It would be a good tool to use to prove step number two, but it doesn't apply. Unfortunately, the hypotheses of the dominated convergence theorem just aren't true in this case. But nevertheless, we can prove it anyway, just using a different method. Okay, the idea goes something like this. We're going to consider um, the difference alpha minus a of t, or in other words, a of 1 minus a of t. Here, remember, the t is somewhere between negative 1 and 1. And actually, it's okay to take t to be positive. So let t be positive and less than 1. And then we're going to let t approach 1 from below. The reason why uh, t can be positive is just because it's going to be approaching 1 anyway. As it gets very close to 1, it's certainly going to be on the positive side. All right? So um, let's see how this looks. a of 1 is like 1 minus a third plus a fifth. Okay, and then we have minus t minus t cubed over 3. Okay, and so on and so on. Now, I claim that I can like distribute this minus sign to all of these terms and then rearrange the terms to basically 
put these two together, you can write it as 1 minus t. Then I'll put the next two together, but I'll factor a minus 1 third out. That's going to give a 1 minus t cubed. Then I'll take, so that, that's going to like represent this term with this term. Then I can take the 1 fifth with uh, that term, factor out the 1 fifth. Okay, so I have to justify that, that all those moves are actually correct. Okay, so like this is a question mark. <clears throat> but the argument that justifies this type of maneuver goes something like this. Starting here, we can just write this as like the limit of the nth partial sum. As n goes to infinity. And then we're subtracting, again, the limit of the nth partial sum of that one, which is going to have a, t, a t to the 2n plus 1 in the numerator. Okay, so in other words, the last term here looks just the same as the last one here. It's just, this just has a t to the 2n plus 1 on top. <clears throat> okay, now, notice that both of these limits exist because both series converge. Right, this series here converges to the value a of t, which is some finite real number, and then this series here converges to this alpha, which is also a finite real number. So both of these limits exist, these two, and that means that we can basically factor out the limit sign to the outside. That's one of the laws of limits, is that the limit of a difference equals the difference of the two limits, provided both individual limits exist. Now you see, in this case, both individual limits do exist. So we're justified in just removing the limit sign. Now you see, once we remove the limit sign, so in here will be this expression minus the other one. Okay, whatever it is. Um, once we remove the limit sign, then you just have a difference of two finite sums. And with finite sums, you can always perform all the algebraic operations. So, you know, I can do exactly what I want. I can distribute the minus sign and then rearrange all the terms. And that's going to give me the limit as n goes to infinity of, you know, 1 minus t, minus a third, 1 minus t cubed, plus a fifth, 1 minus t to the fifth, and so on. Basically up until the nth term. It's going to be like negative 1 to the n over 2n plus 1, times 1 minus t to the 2n plus 1. But you'll notice that that is just a partial sum. In other words, the expression we ended up with in these brackets is just literally a partial sum of this series. And we're taking the limit of that partial sum as the number of terms goes to infinity. Now we already know that this limit exists, because at this step here, when we removed the limit sign, kind of factored out the limit sign to the outside, the resulting limit, which is this one here, exists. That's all part of the theorem. The theorem, by the theorem, I'm saying like this, if I have two sequences that both are known to converge, then it follows that their difference also has a limit, and that limit happens to be a minus b. That's kind of the theorem we're using here. So this limit is already known to exist. But you see that it also turns out to be the limit of the partial sums of this series. So what that tells us is that this series therefore converges. We can conclude that the series in the green box here converges. And we can also conclude that the value or sum of the series is equal to um, everything else, all the other quantities. Because after all, the full sum of a series is nothing but the limit of the nth partial sum as n goes to infinity, which is precisely the quantity we have here in the bottom line. So that is just exactly the full sum of that series. Okay, so that which brings this quantity into equality with all the other ones. Okay, so one thing that we can immediately infer from uh, this equation, in other words, from the fact that this difference is equal to this series, the sum of this series, we can immediately infer that this difference must be non-negative. So let me put it with the three dots indicating that it's a conclusion. Oh, um, in case you haven't seen that before, this triangle of dots is a shorthand for, for therefore. You use it to symbolize you know, when you've made a conclusion. Okay, so I can conclude from my equation, this equation that I checked in red, that um, this quantity, alpha minus a of t, is non-negative. Okay, why? Well, it goes something like this. What I'm going to do is just try to factor out a 1 minus t from every single term. So you see that the first term is 1 minus t. So um, when I factor 1 minus t out, I'll just be left with a 1. But then you also notice that this is just a, a difference of cubes. It's like 1 cubed minus t cubed, and 1 minus t factors out of that. Okay, um, more generally, we've seen this formula before. Okay, when uh, we talked about the sum of a finite geometric series, we said that if you add up like the first n powers of t, starting at the zeroth power, you end up with this quantity here, as long as t is not, uh, not equal to 1. Right? And it was this expression here that we took the limit as n went to infinity to get the classic expression for the sum of the full geometric series, because we showed that t to the n goes to 0, as long as t is strictly between minus 1 and 1. So this term you know, goes, goes away, and this yields the full sum of the geometric series, starting at the zeroth power. So anyway, but I, I don't want to use it for that. I want to use it just as a kind of a factoring formula. You see, if I um, multiply through on both sides by this denominator, put it on the other side, it gives me a factorization of 1 minus t to the n. And notice that 1 minus t factors out. So you see that we have 1 minus t to the power n in every term. Here n is 3, here n is 5, n is 7. So we can use that factorization formula in every term. And we also know that when a series converges, as this one does, if there's a common factor in all the terms, we can factor it out. So we can, this is a legitimate thing I'm doing here. And what's left is like minus a third, and you're going to have 1 plus t plus t squared. Then you'll have plus a fifth, 1 plus t plus t squared plus t cubed plus t to the fourth. Right, then you'll have like the sum of all the powers to the sixth power, and so on. Okay, so this is a legitimate expression. And um, maybe just to have a shorthand notation for this, I'm going to, um, let me call this expression here, a3, and what I mean by that is it's the average, the a there stands for average. So a3 is the average of the first three powers, starting at the zeroth power. In other words, it's one third, one plus t plus t squared. And let's write that in general. This will be the average of the first n powers of t. 
um, starting with the zeroth power. Okay. So you'll notice then that like this next term here is a5. Then you have this group, which is minus a7. And you'll have like plus a9 and so on. Right, and we know that the resulting series converges because um, when you multiply this one minus t back in, we know that the resulting series converges. And you can always take any common factor and factor it out. If one side converges, then so must the other. Right, so like we have this theorem that if, if I have a convergent series, if I know that this converges, then it follows that this one converges too. And in fact, its sum is just given by c times the sum of the original. Right, but you see, it goes the other way too. If I know that, um, let's say I know that this series converges. Suppose I'm, I'm given that. Right, so then uh, what I can do is I can say, well, by the prior theorem, so must this one, as long as c is not zero. And in fact, the one over c can be pulled out. Right, but you'll notice that this here is just the sum of an. So yeah, this original series converges too. And so if the thing with the factor already distributed converges, it implies that the series without the factor distributed also converges. So we know that if I distribute, the resulting series converges. And therefore, if I undistribute, the series I have left here also converges. Okay, so this is a legitimate convergent expression. All right, but now you see that we can infer something nice from this. So I claim, yeah, let me just also label this as a naught. So a naught is one by definition. Okay, yeah, so I claim that this sequence, a naught, a one, a two, a three, and so on, is a decreasing sequence of positive numbers. And let's take a moment to see why that's true. So here's the basic idea. I'm right now assuming that t is between zero and one. Remember, um, we said that here. So that means that the powers of t will be decreasing. Right? The highest power of t is t to the zero, which is one. That's going to be greater than t to the one, which is greater than t squared, <coughs> and in general, greater than t to the n, and so on. But notice that all of these are also positive. All these powers are all positive because they're all uh, powers of a positive number, <coughs> t. And then these averages, right? they're averages of these powers. So they're certainly positive. Right? The nth one of them is a sum of positive numbers over n. So certainly they're all positive for all n. But how do I know that they're decreasing? Right, so that's a little argument that we, we can give easily here. What I want to know is that a sub n is larger than a sub n plus 1. In other words, if I add up the first n powers of t, including the zeroth power, and divide by n, that should come out greater than. So let me ask this as a question. All right, notice that I now have one more term, and then I'll divide by n plus 1. Okay, so just for simplicity, let me call this entire numerator uh, temporarily something like, um, I don't know, beta. And that, that's beta as well, <clears throat> but there's this additional term. So what I'm going to do is just cross-multiply, which will give a completely equivalent inequality because both denominators are positive. They're both positive integers. So multiplying through or dividing through by those two denominators will have no effect on the truth or falsehood of this inequality. Right? So the multiplied out version is going to have n plus 1 on this side multiplied by beta. And then we're asking, is that greater than? And then you'll have the n on this side, but you'll have beta plus t to the nth power, like that. Right? Now you can see that if you distribute everything, there's a term n beta on both sides, <clears throat> and we can subtract that away. And so it's equivalent to ask, is beta times 1 greater than n times t to the n? So it all boils down to that. <clears throat> okay, but you can see that that's true because beta is a sum of terms. You have exactly n terms. And then what about n times t to the n? <clears throat> Excuse me. n times t to the n, you can write that also as a sum of n terms, where each one is just t to the n. And remember that the powers are decreasing. So t to the n, this quantity here, is smaller than every single one of these. So like 1 is greater than t to the n. Also t is greater than the next copy. So yeah, it's going like this. 1, this 1 is greater than t to the n. Also, this t is greater than this t to the n. This t squared is going to be greater than the next one. t to the n minus 1 is going to be greater than that last t to the n. So indeed, we've checked that this inequality here is true. And then if we just work backwards, this one is true, therefore this one is true, therefore this one is true, uh, therefore this one is true. Okay, so that checks that it's really a decreasing sequence. Now the reason why that's good is because it means that if we group the terms in twos, so common trick we've done a lot, you see that this group here is positive because a3 is less than a naught. A3 is less than, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called it a0, I'll call it a1. Yeah. Okay, so a3 is less than a1, and therefore 1 minus a3, or a1, minus a3 is positive. Right. Similarly, a7 is less than a5, so you're subtracting the smaller from the greater, and you'll get positive difference. So by grouping in twos, we see that we can write that series as just a sum of positive numbers, which is positive. The sum of that is strictly positive. So that whole expression there in the square brackets is strictly positive, and then also 1 minus t is strictly positive as well, because recall that t is between 0 and 1. So 1 minus t, that's the greater minus the smaller. And obviously the product of two positive numbers is positive. So we can infer that this quantity here is strictly positive. Okay, so actually even better, we can say that it's strictly positive. Or another way to say that is that a of t is strictly less than alpha um, when t is between zero and one. Okay, but there's still the question what happens as t approaches one from below? We haven't answered that question yet. <clears throat> All right, we can easily answer that question just by looking at this factorization. So we already know that this is positive, we just check that. And therefore, if I can show that this upper bound goes to zero, <clears throat> then the squeeze theorem will tell me that this quantity here must be going to zero. Okay, now I don't know that yet. Oh, that is going to zero as t approaches one from below. Okay, so actually I should pause here and just um, clarify something. So far in our course, we've only ever dealt with a limit of a sequence. So you have basically a function of n, 
where the n is an integer valued variable and it's going to infinity. And then the a sub n, the terms of the sequence, could approach some limit L, which could be a real number or a complex number. But in every case we've dealt with limits, it's always been of that type. It's called a sequential limit, the limit of a sequence. Now here I'm doing something slightly different. I'm letting t approach 1 from below, sort of in a continuous fashion. t is not an integer valued subscript. It's a continuous variable. And it's like positioned less than 1 to the left of 1, and it's moving continuously, gradually, towards 1 from below. Kind of taking on every point on the real line, in the, you know, on its way towards 1. So it's not, it's not taking on just like the integer values or anything like that. And as that's happening, as t is continuously approaching 1 from below, we're asking what is the tendency of this quantity here? Does it approach a limit? And the claim is that it does approach a limit, which is 0. And that's going kind to of follow by the squeeze theorem. As long as we can prove that our upper bound, which is this whole thing, right? As long as we can prove that that upper bound goes to 0, then since there's a 0 below the quantity in question, and then there's something above that is decaying to 0, then the squeeze theorem is going to tell us that the middle quantity is going to kind of be squeezed towards 0 as well. But notice that this is a different type of limit process. It's not a sequential limit. It's what's called a functional limit. Because we have a function of t, uh, namely alpha minus a of t. And as t approaches something, gradually or continuously, we want to know what does that function tend to. So it's not a sequence whose limit we're taking here, it's a function of t, a function of a continuous variable. So we call that a functional limit. It's a slightly different type of limit process. But it's really quite similar. The only difference is that the variable used to be only integer valued, and it could only approach infinity. Whereas now the variable is continuous, real valued, and it can approach any point. So something like 1, for instance. Other than that, the definitions are exactly the same. So I'm going to um, not be any more formal than that. I'm just going to say that the two definitions, the definition of a sequential limit and the definition of a functional limit, are virtually identical, with the only differences being that the variable, in the case of a functional limit, does not have to be an integer. It can be a continuous variable. <clears throat> and also, that variable doesn't have to approach infinity. It can approach any point on the real line. Or it could approach plus infinity or minus infinity. Okay? Because, you know, in theory, you could take t and move it to the right continuously, sort of indefinitely far. So that's, that would be written this way. Or you could move it continuously to the left indefinitely. So those are also possibilities. <clears throat> But anyway, other than that, the definitions are the same. The idea is that you, um, we want to get the function of t in question very close to its limit within epsilon units, provided t is close to the special point that it's approaching. So it's going to look something like this. For every positive epsilon, there is a positive delta corresponding to epsilon, such that we get, we get the function of t to be within epsilon units of its limit, L, whenever t is close enough to uh, t naught within delta units of t naught. So this would be the definition of this idea that as t approaches t naught, f of t approaches l. Or to put it differently, l is the limit of f of t as t approaches t0. Okay? And then if, um, if I further restrict to, let's say, approaching from below, so that would go here in, in the symbol, then there would be a further restriction, which is that we would put here in the definition, provided you know, they're sufficiently close together within delta, and provided that like, t is less than t0, or less than or equal, so that you're on the correct side of t0, the lower side. Right? Or you could have this notion, where t is approaching t0 from above, and that would go here in the, in the symbol. And then this inequality would just flip. t would be above t0 and getting close to it. So the definition of functional limits is no big deal. It resembles almost exactly the definition of sequential limits. And that's really kind of what's going on here in our situation. All right, well, coming to that, the only question remaining is, does this expression in this green box here actually approach zero? You know, does this actually approach zero as t goes to one from below? And the answer is yes, because you see, this difference here already approaches zero as t goes to one. Obviously, if t is getting very close to one, then one minus t is getting very close to zero. But what about the other factor? What about the factor here in the square brackets? See, the danger is that if you have a product where one factor is going to zero, if the other factor is getting infinitely large, then you can't predict the behavior. A good example of this is, um, think about, like, let's say t going to zero, and I'll have a factor of t squared, which is going to zero, and then a factor of, let's say, one over t, which is actually going to infinity. But let's say t is going to zero from above. So one over t is going to go to plus infinity. But what about the product? Now, well, you can see that the product is t, which is going to zero. However, if I had made it one over t cubed instead of one over t, then the product would be one over t, which would be going to infinity. And if I had made it 1 over t squared, which is also going to plus infinity, then the product is 1, which is approaching 1. So you see that any behavior is possible. That's called a 0 times infinity form. It's a kind of a limit in which one factor in a product is going to 0, and the other factor in the product is going to either plus infinity or minus infinity. And the problem is that you can't predict what the limit is going to be, or even if the limit is going to exist. However, in our case, the expression in, the square, in these heavy square brackets here is actually less than or equal to 1. I claim that that whole expression in the square brackets is a positive quantity less than 1. So it's bounded. It cannot be going to infinity. So since that factor is bounded, the other factor going to 0 dominates, and the whole product will go to 0. Right, more formally speaking, uh, the argument's going to go like this. We already know this upper bound. And what I'm going to say is that this whole thing is a positive number that's less than 1, which means that we have an additional upper bound like this. Right, because since this factor is less than 1, if I increase it and make it a 1, then I get this, which is times 1. And that's an even bigger quantity. So that gives me the upper bound 1 minus t, and that clearly goes to 0 as t approaches 1 from below. So the squeeze theorem is going to tell us that this quantity here goes to 0, also as t approaches 1 from below. In other words, a of t approaches alpha as t approaches 1 from below. Because alpha is just a fixed constant. It's only a of t that really depends on t. So that must be getting close to that fixed constant if their difference is going to zero. Okay, now that's exactly what we wanted to prove. Well, okay, we really also would like to prove that that's, that constant is pi over 4. We don't know that yet. 
So we have to prove that separately. But at least we'll be proving the correct limit behavior, because we do know that this constant is a of 1. By definition, we define a of 1 to be that constant. Remember, that constant is just the sum of the series, 1 minus a third plus a fifth, which we know converges. That's the definition of alpha, and it's also the definition of a of 1. We just chose to define a of 1 in that way. So we're getting the correct limit behavior. a of t gets close to a of 1, as t gets close to 1 from below. That's exactly what we wanted to prove. And then later, or in a few minutes, we will show that this alpha is also pi over 4. We don't quite know that yet. Okay, that will follow. All right, anyway, the only statement that I haven't proven in all of this is the fact that uh, this number here in the, in the square brackets is positive and less than 1. Okay, well, we already know it's positive. We said that already. Uh, right here, this. Remember, I asserted this, this whole expression is positive. And that's because you can group the terms in twos, and then all the groups will be positive numbers, and you're adding them all up. So that, there's no problem with that. Okay, but how do I know it's less than 1? Right, it's the same trick. I'll take my series. All right, and I'm going to group the terms in twos again, but I'm, now the groups are going to be these groups. You see, all these groups are, are negative because um, a5 is smaller than a3, but I'm subtracting a3 from a5. Right? I'm taking a5 and then subtracting a3 from that. So I'm subtracting the larger number from the smaller number, and that gives me a negative quantity. Right? Similarly, um, if I subtract a7 from a9, that gives me a negative quantity, because a7 is the larger of those two, a9 is the smaller. So I have 1 minus something minus something minus something. Right? In other words, 1 plus a negative number plus another negative number plus another negative number. And that's clearly something less than 1. Okay, so that uh, completes the proof of that statement. All right, let's see where we are in our multi-step process. We have these five steps that we have to complete. Okay, so we just completed step number two. All right, now let's look at step number three, which is actually quite easy. We just want to show that if we take the tangent of a of t, we get back t. But this is only for the original domain, where t is like strictly between minus one and one. Okay, so that's actually going to be pretty fast and easy. Here's the idea. Um, remember we had this identity in a prior video when t was in that domain. And what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to separate this into real and imaginary parts in two different ways. This side can be separated in the following way. 1 over this modulus plus i times t over the same modulus. So you see, this is the real part, and this is the imaginary part. Because clearly, the expression in these parentheses here is real. It's 1 over a modulus. Right? And the expression here is real as well. It's t over a modulus, and t is real. So I've managed to separate the number into a real plus i times a real. And that always identifies the unique real part and the unique imaginary part. Right? But on the other hand, I can separate this into real and imaginary parts by Euler's formula. Because e to the i theta, where theta is real, is always cos theta plus i sine theta. So I'm just applying this where theta happens to be a of t, which is certainly real. All right, and now that identifies, oh, because cosine is real, obviously the cosine of any real number is real. And because the sine of any real number is also real, that identifies this as the real part and this is the imaginary part. And now you can equate the two. So I can calculate the tangent of a of t just by dividing the sine by the cosine. And that means dividing t over this modulus by 1 over this modulus. And then by multiplying top and bottom by that modulus, you just get t over 1, in other words, t. Okay. So that completes the proof. Tangent of a of t comes out to t for every value of t in this domain. That, that completes the proof of item 3 there. Great. All right, now there's still this matter. Remember, we took some trouble to prove that the tangent of pi over 4 is 1, but in a totally unrelated way, it also happens that the tangent of a of 1 is 1. And that's what we have to prove next. All right, and then the last thing to prove is that the tangent function is strictly increasing in this interval, and that the number a of 1 satisfies these bounds. Okay, because remember, that the number pi over 4 certainly satisfies those bounds, kind of obviously. All right, so let's try to prove, first of all, that the tangent of a of 1 is 1. Of course, we're going to start from this identity that we just proved, when t is uh, between negative 1 and 1 strictly. And what I'm going to try to do is basically just take limits on both sides. Take limits on both sides as t goes to 1 from below. See, this side is very cooperative because t is approaching 1, so we're going to know the limit on that side easily. Also, in here, we know that a of t is approaching a of 1 as t approaches 1 from below, as we proved that just a moment ago. The only question is, does the tangent of a of t approach the tangent of a of 1? I claim it does. But that's a question. So in other words, this is something that's clear. t is approaching 1, because that's exactly what we're allowing to happen. Also, a of t inside here is approaching a of 1. We know that already, because we proved it. That was the last big thing we just proved. Right? But then the question is, just because a of t is approaching a of 1, does that tell us that the tangent of a of t must be approaching the tangent of a of 1? That's, if we can establish that, then we'll be done. Because then the limit is going to be this quantity on the one hand, but it's also going to be this quantity on the other hand. Now, since limits are unique, you know, an expression cannot approach two distinct limits. Because, you know, to approach something means to get very close to it and stay very close to it. So if I had two distinct limits, right, on the one hand, the expression would have to get very close and stay very close to this limit, but on the other hand, it would have to get very close to this one and stay very close to that one. And that's a contradiction. You can't be simultaneously close to both of those. So limits are unique uh, whenever they exist. And th that's going to allow us to equate the two limits. And so as a conclusion, we're going to say that on the one hand, the limit is tangent of a of 1. On the other hand, the limit is 1. So those two limits must be equal. That's exactly what we want. So it all boils down to this. And it really has nothing to do with a of t in particular. It's a much more general statement. It's really saying that if theta approaches a limit, let's say theta naught, then the tangent of theta should approach the tangent of theta naught. Okay? Now there is one more restriction here, 
which is that the, um, theta, of course, should be approaching theta naught, but also both of them, both theta and theta naught, have to be in the domain of the tangent function, right? Because if theta were not in the domain of the tangent function, then this expression tan theta wouldn't make any sense. Also, if theta naught were not in the domain, then this expression wouldn't make any sense. So to ensure that both of those expressions are defined, we need both of the right, both theta and theta naught to be in the domain. Now, to ensure that they are, I'm going to just take them both to be in this main interval from minus pi over two to pi over two. We know that that interval is in the domain of tangent because remember we talked about the fact that the domain of tangent is basically all reals minus the roots of cosine. And we determined exactly what those are. They were like pi over two plus any multiple of, of pi. Oops. Any integer multiple of pi. So you take all reals and you subtract away or delete those points. Okay, now among those points are, of course, pi over two, but also minus pi over two, which is pi over two plus negative one times pi. However, those are consecutive elements of that set because negative one is like integer with the smallest possible absolute value other than zero. But obviously, zero is an integer and its absolute value is zero. But other than zero, what are the integers that have the smallest absolute value? Well, obviously, one and minus one. So since this minus one here is already of the smallest possible absolute value other than zero, it tells us that these two points, pi over two and minus pi over two, are consecutive elements of this set. Okay, by consecutive, what I mean is that there are no elements of the set between them. So like there's pi over two, there's minus pi over two. There's also a point here, which is pi over two plus pi, which is three pi over two, right, and so on. But there are no elements of that set between these two. So that means that the entire interval between these two, open interval, is contained within the domain of the tangent. And just to be on the safe side, let's restrict both of these to be in that interval. Okay, so you see that if I can prove this lemma, let me call this statement here in this yellow box a lemma. Okay, if we can prove this lemma, then we can apply it to our situation. But to, to apply it successfully to our situation, we're taking this to be our theta and this to be our theta naught. So we have to check that those are in the correct interval. Okay, but we need to check that um, a of t and also a of 1 are both in the interval between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So how do we know that? Let's talk about that first. All right. So let's remember that alpha is the sum of this series. And you can see that that's less than 1 uh, by this argument, grouping by 2s. <clears throat> right, so like negative a third plus a fifth is clearly negative because one third is bigger than one fifth and you're subtracting it away. So these two terms are negative, these two terms add up to a negative number, and you have all these negative groups. Okay, but on the other hand, pi over two is bigger than one um, because we know that pi is between two and four. So clearly pi over two, right, pi is the larger of those two, so their ratio is bigger than one. Okay, and then the other thing you have to remember is that alpha is also known to be positive and therefore also greater than minus pi over two. Okay, so the value of alpha, or in other words, a of one, is clearly strictly less than pi over two and strictly greater than minus pi over two. So it's in the correct interval. And then as for a of t, okay, the first thing to notice is that when t is between zero and one, as we're assuming right now, this a of t is clearly positive. So on the one hand, we have this inequality. And so certainly it's greater than pi over two, or sorry, negative pi over two. Okay, so right, I'm saying clearly it's positive, but how do I know that? Okay, again, it's grouping by twos. If you group these first two terms together, you see t cubed is less than t because t is a number between zero and one. So the higher the power you raise it to, the smaller it gets. Okay, and therefore t cubed over three is even smaller than that. So if I take t and subtract away this smaller number, I'm left with something positive. And a very similar argument will show that like the group consisting of the next two terms is also positive. Okay, let's take a look at that one. So we can start with the fact that t to the fifth, or let's say t to the seventh, is less than t to the fifth. Again, the higher the exponent, the smaller the number, because t is in this range. Okay, and therefore t to the 7th over 7 is less than t to the 5th over 7, just by dividing through by 7. And then that's also less than t to the 5th over 5, because the bigger denominator between these two right, gives the smaller fraction. So you see that um, t to the 7 over 7 is smaller, t to the 5 over 5 is bigger, and you're subtracting the smaller from the bigger. So that difference is also positive. Okay, and a similar argument can be done in general. So what you get is like a positive term plus a positive term plus a positive term, and that sum is clearly positive. Alright, and then finally, let's remember that we one of the things we proved earlier was this inequality. In fact, we have these bounds. This is when, again, t was between 0 and 1. But let's focus in particular on this inequality here. What this says, if you rearrange it, is that a of t is less than alpha. Right? We can just take the term a of t and move it over to the other side. So we know that a of t is positive, we know it's also less than alpha, and we know that alpha is less than 1, which is less than pi over 2. Okay, so we have all the inequalities we need. We, we know that a of t is in the correct interval, and we know that a of 1, in other words, alpha, is also in the correct interval. Okay, and so therefore, it, um, it's acceptable to take this theta here to be a of t and take theta naught to be a of 1 um, because that fits into this lemma. Right? This lemma here requires both theta and theta naught to be in that interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Well, we just proved that a of t is indeed in that interval for every, for every t uh, between 0 and 1. And we proved also that a of 1 is also in that interval. So the value of theta that we're considering and the value of theta naught that we wish to consider, they're both in the appropriate interval. Okay, And also we know that theta is approaching theta naught because we've already proven that a of t, which is our theta, is approaching a of 1, which is our theta naught, right? as t approaches 1 from below. So all that remains to be done is to actually prove this lemma. And that's easy. 
Okay, so again, we're assuming that we have theta and theta naught in the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we're assuming that theta is approaching theta naught. And we would like to prove that tan of theta must approach tan of theta naught. All right, so the idea is to write theta as theta naught plus a difference, delta. So in other words, I'm defining delta as theta minus theta naught. And notice that that's going to zero, because that's just equivalent to this condition here. Okay, and then we can just look at the tangent of theta. All right, so now um, there's a kind of classic addition formula for tangent. I'll just write the result here. You've probably seen it. It looks like that. Okay, it's very easy to get. Basically, if you, in general, you would just use the definition of tangent. And then use the addition formula for sine on top. And then use the addition formula for cosine on the bottom. Okay, and, and now all you have to do is like divide top and bottom. Take the entire top and divide it by both cosines. Cos alpha and cos beta. Right, and do the same on the bottom. And you'll see that what happens is um, you'll get like sine alpha over cos alpha plus sine beta over cos beta. And then on the bottom you'll get a 1. And then minus sine alpha over cosine alpha times sine beta over cosine beta. All right, but then sine over cosine is just tangent. So yeah, in the end, what you're getting is tan alpha plus tan beta over 1 minus tan alpha times tan beta. Okay, so that's the classic addition formula for tangent. Anyway, so using that here, let's see what we know. Um, I claim that since delta is going to 0, that's going to imply that tan delta is also going to 0. But I have to back that up. I have to you know, explain why that's true. But if you'll just take that on faith for the moment, you can see what this argument is going to, is going to give us. This is going to be approaching just tan of theta naught, right, because this term goes to 0. But then also this factor goes to zero, and this factor is just some constant. So that means that that entire term is going to go to zero. And the bottom is just going to approach one, because it's like it's one minus zero. So you see that the limit is just tan of theta naught. And that proves that tan of theta is approaching tan of theta naught as delta goes to zero. And of course, delta going to zero is completely equivalent to theta approaching theta naught. Okay, so you see that we get the correct conclusion. That when theta approaches theta naught, then tangent of theta must approach tangent of theta naught. Okay, provided, of course, that both... Uh, that these values are in the correct interval. Now, where did I use that fact? You may wonder, where did I ever use in this argument the, the idea that like theta and theta naught are both in that interval? Okay, well, I didn't really use it directly. We just, I just used the fact that, okay, when two values are both in, a, in the same interval, then so, so are all the values between them. Right? So like, if theta and theta naught are both in the same interval, let's say, right, in this case, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, it means that all the points in between them are also in that same interval, because that's the property of intervals. Every interval has that property. If you pick any two distinct points in an interval, all the points between them are also in that interval. And that, that simply means that theta can approach theta naught continuously without ever leaving the domain of the tangent function. Right? Because the domain of the tangent function has a bunch of holes in it. It's like it has a hole at minus pi over 2, and then it has a hole at pi over 2, and then a hole at 3 pi over 2, and so on. So what I need to know is simply that as theta can approach theta naught continuously without ever leaving the domain, and forcing both of them to be in, the, in this interval achieves that, because that interval is entirely contained within the domain of the tangent. Okay, so that's really where I'm using this assumption here. Okay, now the only thing left to prove is this little piece here. That if delta goes to zero, then tan of, tan of delta goes to zero. Okay, and that's not, not terribly difficult. Let's look at it. Okay, tan of delta is just sine of delta over cos of delta. And what I can do is take the absolute value. Okay, now remember that delta is on its way to zero. So delta is small, and if we like, we can take delta to be less than one. There's no loss of generality. Okay. We can take the absolute value of delta to be less than 1, because we know that delta is supposed to be approaching 0 anyway. So if we wait long enough, as it gets close to 0, certainly it's going to be you know, between negative 1 and 1. Right, the relevance of that is that we have this series definition of cosine. Okay, and by grouping terms, we can see that um, if delta is between minus 1 and 1, then cosine of delta is at least 1 minus delta squared over 2. Yeah, at least. Okay, because what you do is you say, like, this group of terms here is a positive group. Um, right, because since delta has absolute value less than 1, the bigger the power, the smaller it is. So like delta to the 6th is less than delta to the 4th. And then if I divide through by 720, which is 6 factorial, I, I get something that's certainly smaller than delta to the 4th over 4 factorial, because this denominator is much bigger. So you see that I'm subtracting something smaller from something bigger, giving a positive difference. Right? And then again, the next group of two terms is going to be positive. So it's the next group. So basically what you have is you have 1 minus delta squared over 2 plus a positive number. Now I said a positive number, but it actually could be 0, because when delta is 0, you see, in the special case when delta is 0, then all of these terms would be 0. So you, you actually just have you'd be adding zero in that case. But in every other case, you're adding a positive number. Okay, so that, that establishes that cosine delta is just this number, one minus delta squared over two, plus some positive amount, or non-negative, always. And that means that cosine delta is greater than or equal. Greater than or equal. All right, and the reason I need that is because I want to bound one over cosine delta, or an absolute value. Oh, by the way, I should also mention, okay, let me just slow it down slightly. Because cosine delta is greater than or equal to this, notice that that's all automatically positive, when delta is of absolute value less than one. Right, because delta squared is gonna be less than one in that case. Since delta is 
of absolute value less than one, it follows that delta squared is less than one. And therefore delta squared over two is less than a half. And so you're subtracting something less than a half from a one. So that's certainly positive. That means that you can write it as its own absolute value. Since it's a positive number, right, we can just write it as its own absolute value. And then what about one over the absolute value? Well, since I have a lower bound for the absolute value, when you take reciprocals on both sides, you end up getting an upper bound. Like that. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is just multiply through by the absolute value of sine delta on both sides. All right, and then finally, I'm going to use the theorem that the absolute value of sine of delta is at most the, ab the absolute value of delta itself. And that's the theorem that we proved you know, in an earlier video. So I'll just recall. Okay, and now finally, um, you see that this goes to zero as delta goes to zero. Okay, because the top is going to zero, obviously, as delta goes to zero. And as for the bottom, it's approaching one minus one half times zero squared. In other words, it's approaching one. So the whole limit is going to be approaching zero over one, in other words, zero. Right, but since this is an absolute value, it's non-negative. And then we have an upper bound, which is also collapsing to zero. So the squeeze theorem tells us that the thing in the middle must also be going to zero. Okay, and then the final step is that because the absolute value of tangent is going to zero, the tangent of delta itself must be going to zero, as delta does. And that's because the only way the absolute value of a number can get very small is if the number itself is very close to zero. So we've got the conclusion we want, and that fully proves. I don't remember what number it was anymore. Let's go back and see. Yeah, okay, so we've got a number four now, and we've got a number five now. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have all of number five. What, what I mean to say is that we just have number four. Yeah, okay, so I'll remind you, like, let me remind you that mm, the idea was Oh, here it is. Okay, yeah, here's, here's the idea that we, end up, we have this identity, tangent of a of t equals t, which we know is true in the original domain, like strictly between negative 1 and 1, but we then just allowed t to get closer and closer to 1 from below on both sides, right? And so clearly, okay, on this side of the equation, t is just getting close to 1, so we know the limit is 1. The only question was, what's the limit on this side of the equation? Okay, and so we, we did that in parts. We did that sort of in pieces. We know that as t goes to 1 from below, a of t goes to a of 1. But we now also know that from this lemma here that we just got through proving, that because a of t is approaching a of 1, and because they're both in the appropriate interval, a of t and a of 1 are both in the interval, minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, this lemma that we just proved tells us that the tangent of a of t must be approaching the tangent of a of 1. So that means that on this side of the equation, we know the limit as well. It's tan of a of 1. And that proves that these two are equal, simply because we can't have two different limits. Right? So that's, that's how we got this conclusion here. So that was exactly item 4. All right. Also, we now have fully established these bounds, if, if you recall, as part of the argument. We know that a of 1 is um, between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, in fact, a of 1 is even greater than 0 and less than 1. Those are tighter bounds, but yeah, certainly we have these bounds here. And the only thing left to prove in the whole process is the fact that tangent is strictly increasing. And then, as I explained earlier, that's going to allow us to conclude that pi over 4 equals a of 1. Or in other words, the pi is 4 times a of 1, which has this series expansion. Okay, anyway, so how do I know that tangent is strictly increasing function on that interval? All right, it's a nice argument. Very pretty proof. Goes like this. What I'm going to consider um, is two inputs, let's call them alpha and beta, both in that interval. So let's say I have alpha and beta, just any two points in that interval. But I'm going to assume that alpha is to the left and beta is to the right. And what I need to prove is that the tangent of alpha is smaller. The tangent of alpha is smaller and the tangent of beta is larger. So this should imply tan alpha is less than tan beta. Okay, so if we just write this, oops, in terms of the definition of tangent, right? Tangent of alpha is just sine alpha over cosine alpha. Tan beta is sine beta over cos beta. You can cross multiply. Now, you have to be careful because when you multiply through by something, you know, it could reverse the inequality if it's negative. But I claim that both cosines are positive. Both of these cosines are positive. And the reason why that's true is because let's recall that the sine graph is positive between 0 and pi, strictly between 0 and pi. And since the cosine graph is essentially a shift of the sine graph, remember uh, we have this like complement law that the cosine of pi over 2 minus theta is the same as the sine of theta. Or if you replace theta with pi over 2 minus theta, which is acceptable because theta is just some arbitrary real number. Since theta is totally arbitrary, you may as well just replace theta with this. It doesn't affect anything, but you have to do it on both sides. And if you do that, then you'll see that cosine can also be regarded as sine of the complement. 90 degrees minus the original angle. So we can think of the cosine curve as essentially just like a reflection and a shift, horizontal shift of the sine curve. Basically, we have to take the sine curve, we have to reflect it around the y-axis because there's a minus theta here. There's a negative in the input. So instead of theta, you're having minus theta. And that's equivalent to just reflecting the curve like this way. So it's like a reflection about the vertical axis. Okay, and then we have the plus pi over 2 inside. We're taking minus theta and adding pi over 2 to that. And that corresponds to like a horizontal translation to the left by pi over 2. 
So we're going to just shift the whole curve by pi over 2 to the left. Pi over 2 is this amount here. So if I take the red curve and shift it left by this amount, pi over 2, what I'll get is... Uh, whoops, sorry. I <clears throat> made a small mistake here. We have to absorb the constant right into the input. So um, what happens is it actually shifts to the right. Okay, you end up getting this green graph, which is the cosine. So the black one was the sine, and the green was the cosine. All right, maybe if you don't like that way of doing it, um, it's a little too complicated, just think about it this way. If I allow theta in this equation here to run from 0 to pi, what's happening to this? What's happening to pi over 2 minus theta? Okay, well, as theta runs from 0 to pi, this quantity is going to run from pi over 2 back to minus pi over 2. In other words, as theta describes that direction from 0 to pi, pi over 2 minus theta is going to go backwards from pi over 2 to minus pi over 2. But you see that um, the these two quantities are the same. So because sine of theta is positive, as theta runs through this range, it follows that the cosine function is positive on this interval, from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, so that proves that the cosine of theta is strictly positive when theta is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. All right, and using that lemma, we, we see that because alpha and beta are both assumed to be in that interval, they both have positive cosines. All right, so we can take this inequality here and just multiply both sides by both cosines, and it won't change the truth or falsehood of this inequality because they're both positive. So we can divide back through by them. So it's like a fully reversible step. All right, so continuing on then with the argument, what we have is we can multiply through on both sides by both cosines. So we'll get... Okay, we, have, we don't know if it's true yet, we're just asking it as a question. But what I'm saying is that the inequality here in this red box is equivalent to this inequality here in this red box. Because I can go back and forth between the two of them. Right? Or to say it differently, if I, if I can prove this one, then we can just divide both sides by both of those cosines. Which are both positive, and therefore they preserve the direction of the inequality. And then you see what will happen is that these cosines will cancel, and these cosines will cancel. And you'll just be left with sine alpha over cosine alpha is less than sine beta over cosine beta. Okay? That will get us back to this inequality, which will get us back to the inequality that we really are trying to prove. Okay? But for now, it's still a question. All right, well, so what we need to prove then is that sine alpha times cos beta is less than cos alpha sine beta. All right, now what I'm going to do is just take this term and move it over, so there'll be a zero on that side. And actually, maybe I'll rearrange it, because now I'm just adding these two quantities, so it doesn't matter in what order I add them. And I prefer to write it this way, simply because now this is recognizable. This is exactly the addition formula for the sine of alpha plus beta. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I was really, really tired when I was recording that. I took a little break. Now I'm much better. Of course, when you subtract this over, you're going to pick up a minus sign here. So what we're getting is sine beta times cos alpha, which was the term already here, minus cos beta sine alpha, which is just another way of rewriting this term. Okay, but that minus sign is important, obviously, because I subtracted that term over. Okay, and now you recognize this, but it's not an addition formula. It's a subtraction formula. It's the sine of beta minus alpha, sine of the difference. <clears throat> okay, let me, since I didn't formally derive that, let me just take a minute um, to just to discuss the idea of a subtraction formula. Okay, so remember that we have these addition formulas. And the one for sine is it's the sine of the first angle, <clears throat> or the first term, times the cosine of the second, plus the cosine of the first times the sine of the second. Now, notice that these are, are true and have been proven for all real numbers, theta and phi. So this phi is completely arbitrary real number. And therefore, we can replace this phi everywhere it occurs by minus phi, since that's also just an equally arbitrary real number. Okay, now, if we make that replacement everywhere, <clears throat> because of this universal quantifier, because this uh, identity is true for every real number, it's going to also be true with negative phi plugged in for phi. Okay? But then this term doesn't change, because the cosine of negative phi is the same as the cosine of phi. Okay? And this sine theta didn't change at all. On the other hand, if you look over here, this becomes sine of minus phi. And because sine is odd, the minus sign just comes out, whereas this term doesn't change, because it involves theta only. Okay? So the result is that the second term just changes its sign, S-I-G-N sign. The first term stays the same, sine theta, cosine phi, but then you'll have a minus. Then you'll have cos theta sine phi. <clears throat> okay, so the subtraction formula for the sine function looks just like the addition formula. The only difference is that you change the middle sign both here and here. So if you, that's a good way to remember um, if you don't want to go through the process of rederiving it, as we just did. Not that it's a big deal to do that. It's a short derivation once you understand the principle. Basically boils down to the fact that cosine is even, whereas sine is odd. But also a good kind of mnemonic way to remember it is that if you've memorized, as you should, the addition formula for sine, if you've memorized, in other words, this formula, you just take that same formula and you literally change this middle sign here to a minus and this middle sign here to a minus. And they will yield the correct formula for subtraction. Okay? And of course, there's also one for cosine. <clears throat> uh, there's a cosine of a difference as well, which is an important formula to know. And that would be cos cos plus sine sine. You'll remember the addition formula for the cosine had a minus in that position. It was cos cos minus sine sine. And so again, all you have to do is just change this middle sign to a minus 
and also change this middle sign to a plus. Change both of the middle signs, and it will yield the correct identity for subtraction formula. Okay, anyway, so over here, this is then the sign of the difference. But the question mark still remains, do I know that the sign of the difference is positive? Okay, and the answer is yes, I do, because remember our assumptions about alpha and beta <clears throat> are these inequalities here. Or you can visually look at it this way. So what can you say about beta minus alpha in that direction? Well, beta minus alpha is positive, <clears throat> right, because beta is the greater of the two, as we assumed here. But also it's at most pi, actually strictly less than pi, because you see that <clears throat> alpha and beta are both in an interval whose length is exactly pi. So the furthest apart they could be is pi, but they can't be quite that far apart because it's an open interval. So the only way they could be exactly pi units apart is if alpha were this endpoint and beta were this endpoint. But since neither of those endpoints is actually included, they can't be quite that far apart. They can be up to, but not equal to, pi units apart. So the number beta minus alpha is between 0 and pi strictly, and we know that the sine function is positive on the open interval 0 to pi. So any value that's strictly between 0 and pi, such as beta minus alpha, will have a positive sign. So the sine of beta minus alpha will indeed be positive. So that proves that inequality, which then we can reverse our steps, right? By expressing the sine of beta minus alpha in this way, and then taking this term and moving it back over, we check this inequality. Okay, and then by dividing by cosine alpha and by cosine beta, we get this inequality. And <clears throat> recall that that's acceptable because both of those cosines are known to be positive. Okay, so that's a complete proof that tangent is uh, an increasing function on the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which completes item 5. I have to go back a long way for this. Yeah, completes item 5, and with it, it completes the proof that pi can be expressed by this formula. Okay, so we had to work pretty hard to get this formula for pi, but it's a very beautiful formula, and I really wanted to uh, prove it rigorously. <clears throat> okay, and using that formula, so, so, so far, we, we only know that pi is between 2 and 4. That's an inequality that I've used several times. And remember where that came from was the fact that um, we knew that the sine function was positive at 2 and negative at 4. And then pi was a root, the leftmost root between those two. But can we get more accurate values for pi? For example, can I prove that pi is greater than 3? Right, and let's say less than, I don't know, 3 and uh, 3.2. How do I localize pi like more, more precisely? Okay, well, you can do it with a series. You just have to sum a large number of terms in this series. And that will give you close, close approximations to pi. And you can also estimate how much error there is in that approximation. That's an important fact. It's not just that you have an approximation of pi. You also have a way to estimate how much error there is in that approximation so that you can be sure that you've got, let's say, the first three decimal places or the first five decimal places. Okay, the reason why you can do that <clears throat> is because... Let me just get a clean slide here. It's an alternating series, alternating in sign. So, for example, let's say I happen to add up the first, say, four terms. And then I look at the rest of the, the, rest of the series. Okay? So this is, let me call it S4. It's like the sum of the first four terms. And then I have the remainder, R4. So S4 can be easily computed. Um, yeah, but the issue is, like, how do we know how close S4 is to pi? Can we estimate the absolute difference? Perhaps we're not going to be able to compute that difference precisely, because that will involve summing this series, which we can't do exactly. But the, the question is, can we sort of get some estimate, some upper, upper limit to how big that difference can be? Right, well, that difference is just the absolute value of R4. Right, but notice that R4 is an alternating series, or expressed as an alternating series. And so because the terms are decreasing in magnitude, like these, if you just look at the magnitudes and not the signs, the terms are decreasing in magnitude. And that just means that 4 ninths, the very first term um, omitted, omitted from S4, is going to give an upper bound. Right? And that's because if you look at the next two terms, they add up to a negative. Then you look at the next two, they add up to a negative, and so on. So R4 is 4 ninths, like minus a certain amount, minus a certain positive quantity, minus another positive quantity, right, by grouping the terms in twos. And that's less than 4 ninths. So certainly less than or equal is good enough. But the point is that we have a way, easy way, of estimating how close the two are. Now 4 ninths is not very good in terms of estimating an error, and S4 is also not a very good approximation to pi. But we can do this with, you know, a large number of terms. And it takes a very large number of terms, actually, to start getting close approximations. Um, so, for, for instance, if I add up the terms all the way up to 4 over 21, or just put this into Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha, it gives me this upper bound. 3.2323. That's not repeating, it's just the next one is 1.5. Okay, anyway, so it gives 3.2, approximately, as an upper bound. To get a lower bound, I can add one more term, which is minus 4 over 23. It's like the very next term. So I'll keep the plus 4 over 21, but then I'll put in the very next term, minus 4 over 23, and that gives 3.0584, so on and so on. So you can see that it's a pretty slowly converging process. Even a fairly large number of terms doesn't get close to pi very quickly, but we are localizing pi. We now know, for example, that pi is between these two. And you can go on, go on like this and localize pi better and better uh, with more and more terms. Okay, um, so where, where do we stand now? Let's take stock of where we stand. What we've done is we've basically given the arctangent a value at 1, which is pi over 4. And we know that the corresponding point on the unit circle can be expressed as, as e to the i times pi over 4. We also know a certain continuity property of the angle measure, which is that as the point x comma y moves towards the point root 2 over 2 comma root 2 over 2 on the unit circle, okay, meaning that it's, point x y is approaching that fixed point but only moving along the unit circle, right, within the region script r, which is which was like between you know these two rays. So what I'm saying is I have some point x y, and it's moving along the unit circle within that region, and as it moves, like it's approaching this fixed point, this fixed point here. Okay, so then we can ask, what is happening to the angle measure of that point? 
as it moves, right? So, for example, when it's here, then its angle in radians is, is like this angle here. So as the point moves toward that blue point, what is happening to, to the angle? Well, we know what the angle is. The radian measure of the angle, and the angle I'm talking about, of course, is the angle that starts with 1, as like one vertex. Sorry. What I mean is this 1, 0, and then that point, that point x, comma y. And let me call that point z. So the angle I'm referring to, of course, is that, that angle there. So the radian measure of the angle, uh, which is capital A of y over x, approaches pi over 4 from below. Okay? So the angle is less than pi over 4, and it's approaching pi over 4 in the limit. And then when you hit that blue point, then the angle is exactly pi over 4, which is what this says. So there's a kind of continuity. The angle doesn't break continuity. The angle just approaches the, the appropriate limit. It doesn't change suddenly at that point. It doesn't jump sort of discontinuously. <clears throat> okay? Now, all of this can be repeated with this point here. The whole same theory. The only difference would be that um, the point would be approaching this way, and the slopes would be negative instead of positive, and they would, the slopes would be approaching minus 1 instead of 1. Right? This line here has slope 1, but this line here has slope minus 1. And then the angle would not approach pi over 4. It would approach negative pi over 4. So I'm going to assume that we understand that. It's just by analogy. Right? And so a of y over x will approach that value, minus pi over 4, as the slope y over x approaches negative 1. Um, from which direction, though? From above. Right? Just like the slope here. So this was i.e. as the slope y over x was approaching 1 from below. We have to have slopes that were less than 1, but positive and less than 1, let's say. And then in the other case, we're going to have slopes like this, which would be negative, but greater than minus 1. And they're going to be moving downwards to approach a slope of minus 1. Okay? And then the angle is going to approach negative pi over 4. So all of that is just by, by analogy with the last case. It works out exactly the same way. Okay, good. So now, I, as I outlined earlier, we can do a number of completions. Whoops. So let's, uh, let me just review that with you briefly. Um, there's this section of the circle here. What do I do? How do I find the angle measure of a point on that section? Okay, well, let's take a look at it. Let's take a point z, coordinates x, y. Again, it has to satisfy that equation to be on the unit circle. That's just another way of saying that the absolute value of z is 1. Okay, and then also the region that z is in here is that um, the slope is greater than 1. The slope of this line, that is, is greater than 1. So also positive. And x is positive. So we're on the right-hand side of the y-axis. Okay, anyway, in that, for such a point z, well, the plan was to reflect it about this line. <clears throat> Okay, and look at this point, because this point here, the blue one, is within the region that we know how to deal with. Okay, and so let me call this point, like, z tilde, temporarily. It's easy to find that point, because, okay, this line is just a diagonal line, y equals x. And everybody knows that the way you reflect any point about that line is by swapping its two coordinates. So in other words, this is just y plus i times x. And we can express that pretty easily in terms of the original z in the following way. Just factor out an i. You'll see that there will be an x there, but also a negative iy. You can see that that's correct by just um, distributing the i back in. That will give you ix in the first term, and then the second term will be minus i squared y. But i squared is negative 1, so that term just becomes plus y. And that's exactly what we are supposed to have there. So it's a correct factorization. And you'll notice that since z is this point, okay, x minus iy is the conjugate of that. So this is nothing but i times z bar, where bar means complex conjugation. Right? So we know how to express this point in terms of an angle. Um, okay, let me just put this down here. Okay. Yeah, we know how to express this point in terms of an angle. Let me put the x-axis in, or the positive x-axis. And there's this ray here. And then there's this angle in radians. And that angle would be capital A of the slope of that line, which is x over y. Notice that x is now in the second coordinate slot. So that's like the rise, and then y is in the horizontal coordinate slot, so that's the run. We're doing rise over run, that's x over y. Okay, the slope of the original line, the red one, was y over x. And the slope of that green line is the reciprocal slope, x over y. <clears throat> okay, so that's the angle for that point. Um, what I mean by that is that we can express z tilde as e to the i times capital A of x over y. Now the question becomes, can we somehow use this fact to express z itself as e to the i theta? Right, but notice that this is the same as i times z bar. And then what I can do is I can um, multiply both sides by z. Here, let me just take this equation. So I'm going to multiply both sides by z. Let me just do this like really step by step. Okay, and then notice that z times z bar is just the modulus squared of z. That's a standard identity in the complex number system. But that's actually 1, 1 squared or 1. Because remember that z is a point on the unit circle. So its modulus is 1. And so therefore I just get i times 1, or just i. Okay. And then um, I can also express i in the form e to the i pi over 2. <clears throat> okay, that's easy to see that that's correct, because e to the i pi over 2 by Euler's formula would be cos pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2. And we've calculated these values at some earlier stage in this video. We computed that cos of pi over 2 is 0, and also sine of pi over 2 is 1. So you see what this comes out to is 0 plus 1 times i, in other words, i. So it's very easy to see that it's a correct expression for i. <clears throat> okay, and then the um, last thing I want to do is multiply both sides by e to the negative i times a of x over y. I just put that factor on both sides. And then I'm going to use the exponential law for pure imaginary exponents twice. See, the product of these two exponentials, we, we do that by just adding up the two exponents. And those add up to zero. So that whole product just gives e to the zero, or one. 
In other words, that just goes away. Okay? But this also is a product of two exponentials with pure imaginary exponents. So we can add up those. And so what we get is an expression for z. Right? All that's left on this side is z. And then on the other side, we're going to have i times pi over 2 minus capital A of x over y. Okay, and that basically solves the angle measure problem for the original point z. What it tells us is that we can express that point z in the form e to the i theta, where theta is pi over 2 minus capital A of the reciprocal slope. So in other words, the angle measure of the red angle, well, it's really an oriented angle, directed angle. So is the green one. So I should put an arrowhead indicating that it's like a directed angle from the positive x axis toward that ray. The positive x axis is the initial ray, and then the red one is the terminal ray, or the green one in this case. Okay, anyway, so that red angle, let me just call it that in the picture, would have measure pi over 2 minus a of x over y. Now let's think about what that is. Pi over 2 means 90 degrees. So this is just saying 90 degrees minus that green angle. A of x over y is that green angle here. So 90 degrees minus that angle means the complementary angle. And you can see why that's true. It's because the green angle is congruent to this blue angle here. The picture has a symmetry about this line. See, there's like a reflection symmetry <coughs> about that line, y equals x, intentionally, because we got the blue point. We got this blue point by reflecting this red point around that line. So we constructed the picture to have a reflection symmetry. But basically, that the angle marked in green, this angle here, right, reflects to become this angle marked in blue. And we're just taking the complement of that, because the red angle is sort of like the rest of quadrant one, apart from the blue. The red and the blue together make up the full quadrant one. And obviously, quadrant one is bounded by a right angle, an angle of measure pi over two. The formal way to say that is just to notice that this i, this point here at the top, i, has an angle measure of pi over two, because this equation is true. Or in other words, i can be expressed as cosine of pi over 2, comma sine of pi over 2. And we just established that a moment ago. So that's why like the quadrantal angle, with starting at the positive x-axis and going to the positive y-axis, has a measure of pi over 2. Okay? So we've now managed to assign an angle to that point z, the original point z over here. It's this angle in radians. Okay? And then it also makes sense to define capital A of the original slope, y over x, to be that angle. Because in the preceding case, um, that is, in, in the case where we looked only within this region, right? Um, capital A of the slope gave us the angle. You took the slope of your, your ray, whatever, like the green one here, and you took the slope of that happened to be um, x over y, and you plug that into the capital A function. And that gives the angle. So the, pr the prescription is, at least in that case that we're familiar with, the basic prescription or recipe for finding the angle is that the angle in radians is capital A of the slope. And so since the slope of this red line is y over x, it makes sense to define capital A of that slope to be this angle measure, so that this relationship still, still holds, even in that case. So you see that we haven't really defined Capital A of y over x is not defined yet, because remember that capital A has only really been defined as of right now on this region, a closed interval between negative 1 and 1. We had originally defined capital A on this open interval. We defined it by series in that case. <clears throat> right, this is for all t in this open interval. <clears throat> right, and then we also worked pretty hard to define it at 1. Well, the definition was this, but we also proved that this comes out to pi over 4, and also at minus 1. And that just comes out to negative pi over 4. <clears throat> okay, so that fully defines the function on this closed interval now. Closed interval from negative 1 to 1. But the slope in question, which is y over x, was greater than 1, remember. In, in the situation we're dealing with right now, the slope was a number greater than 1. So the capital A value of that is undefined. We haven't defined it yet. And what I'm proposing to do is to define it this way. As pi over 2 minus capital A of the reciprocal slope. And if we define it that way, then, because of what we just proved here, in this red box, we'll also be able to write z equals e to the i times a of the slope. And that will be a correct equation even in this case. Because... This quantity here, a of y over x, is by definition this. And we know that this equation is true. So therefore, this equation will be true by definition. Okay, so in other words, it allows us to take the same formula, or the same prescription, which is that capital A of the slope gives the angle, and um, use that even in the case where z is like in this location there. Okay, so what that motivates us to do is to extend the capital A function to this region here, the region where t is greater than 1. And we extend it by just defining, we're now going to define a of t as pi over 2 minus a of 1 over t, the reciprocal, when t is a number greater than 1. Okay, so that's going to serve as our definition of the capital A function in the case when t is greater than 1. Now, let's first notice that that makes sense mathematically, because since t is greater than 1, it follows that its reciprocal is certainly positive, since t itself is positive, but also less than 1. And that means that the reciprocal belongs to the open interval, which was the original domain of the capital A function. So yeah, 1 over t can certainly be plugged in to the capital A function, because it's the previous case. It's the case of the capital A function that we started with. Right, and so that gives a meaning to this side. Whatever value you get out of this whole expression gives a meaning to this side in the case when t is bigger than 1. So let's, let's look at an example. Um, how would I calculate, for example, a of 2? Okay, well, it's just pi over 2 minus a of a half. And we know how to calculate a of a half. It's just a half minus one third times a half cubed plus one fifth times a half to the fifth, and so on and so on. Okay, and that's a convergent series because the number one half is, you know, between minus one and one. Okay, and more generally, we can have a convergent series in this case. It just doesn't look like the original series. What it looks like is this, pi over 2 minus, then we're going to have one over t minus a third, one over t cubed, plus one fifth, one over t to the fifth, and so on and so on. So we can write that in a slightly more pleasant form by just distributing the minus and also by 
simplifying these fractions. Here we get something like this. So that is the formula for computing, um, to any desired accuracy, the value of capital A of t in the case when t is greater than 1. Okay, so that, now what's the domain of the capital A function? Well, it was already defined in this closed interval, and now it's also defined in, like, the rest of this portion of the real line. Okay, and then also by symmetry, we can find it in this region too, when t is less than negative 1. When I say symmetry, what I mean is that the capital A is an odd function, at least where it's been defined so far. It's been an odd function. Now it has values here, and we can just extend it to keep it an odd function. Right? So we're going to define when t is less than negative 1. We'll define a of t in that case. Well, if we want to do the analogous thing, the exactly analogous thing to this, it would be to say that it's minus pi over 2 plus a of the reciprocal. Now you'll notice that that is nothing but the negative of pi over 2 minus <coughs> a of the reciprocal. Let's see, did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, this is not the relevant thing. Sorry, the relevant thing is that um, we can write this as like minus a of minus 1 over t, because a itself is an odd function where it's been defined, and anywhere it's already been defined. And in this case, I'm talking about the open interval 0, or negative 1 to 1. And so this extra minus sign here can be brought out and just cancel with that extra minus sign out there. So let's just cancel. Okay, but um, the advantage of writing it this way is that then I can put the minus in like the denominator as a, ne a negative t. And now you see that... Um, yep, sorry, I'm confusing myself a little bit here. This should be a minus. And we can bring that minus inside. Okay, and now we can factor out the minus. Right, and then you'll notice that this is just exactly a of negative t from the previous case. Because when if t is less than negative 1, by multiplying both sides by minus 1, we see that negative t is greater than 1. So that goes, takes us back to this case, but for negative t instead of t. So if we just um, look at this case, right, but we replace t with negative t everywhere, that's the correct formula. And that's what I'm saying here. a of minus t, in this case, because minus t is greater than 1, can be expressed as pi over 2 minus a of the reciprocal of negative t. So in other words, what we get is minus a of minus t. And that means that capital A is still an odd function. It's defined in such a way that it stays an odd function, because it satisfies this. Or to put it differently, if I put the minus sign on the other side, this outer minus sign, right, you can multiply both sides by negative 1. Okay, so this law is now true for all real t. It was already true in the interval 0 to, or negative 1 to 1. <clears throat> and now it stays true for values out here, or out here. So capital A has been extended now successfully to the entire real line, and it's still an odd function on the entire real line. And it's at this point that we can call it arctan. We're going to introduce the notation arctan of t for what we've previously been calling capital A of t. <clears throat> Here t is just any real number. And we know that it's an odd function. Okay, but notice that it's given by different formulas in different cases. Like, you have to calculate it, you have to use different formulas in different cases. You would use this series if t is between 1 and negative 1, including both of the endpoints. Because as we've seen, you know, doing 1 minus a third plus a fifth and so on will give you the correct value, which is pi over 4. So you can let t equal 1 in that case, and also t equal negative 1 in that case. Right. Then you have the case where t is greater than 1, in which case you have this, pi over 2 minus 1 over t plus 1 over 3t cubed minus 1 over 5t to the fifth. Right. And then there's the last case where t is less than negative 1, which would just be the negative. Okay. Or um, more properly, you first have to take a of negative t, so take this formula here and just replace t with negative t everywhere, and then you have to negate the entire thing. So if we do that, see, um, taking the formula in this blue box and replacing every t with negative t will just change all these signs. Like, this sign here will change to a plus. This one will change to a minus. This will change to a plus, and so on. But then we still have to negate that entire thing because of this outer minus sign there. So what that yields is um, it goes back to a minus, and then a plus. <coughs> so that gives the correct formula for t less than negative 1. So where we are at this point in our solution of the angle measure problem is that um, we now know how to solve the angle measure problem for all points on the unit circle on the right-hand side of the y-axis. All the points here, whether it be here or here here, whatever, all points like this, <clears throat> okay, not including those two open circles, which are the points i and minus i. Actually, we do know how to solve the angle measure problem, even at those two points, we just haven't checked the continuity yet, but it's an easy thing to check. Okay, by continuity, what I mean is, <clears throat> you'll remember that, like in this case, we had this special point where the angle was pi over 4, and yeah, that's a pretty bad picture. Maybe it's this point, actually. So the directed angle there was pi over 4, right? And by continuity, what I meant was that, as you take a slope slightly less than 1 and let, it, let the slope approach 1, the angle the angle measure of this, which was like capital A of y over x, was approaching that direct value, pi over 4, from below. So there's also a continuity question. Oh, and by the way, <coughs> before I even address that new continuity question, what about approaching the other way? <coughs> this, this situation was where the slope of this green line is approaching 1 from below. But what if I took a line that was very close to 1 in slope, and it was approaching 1 from above instead, meaning it's going this way? Would I still have the correct continuity? If I look at the angle formed from the positive x-axis to that yellow ray, like this angle here, does that approach pi over 4? as the slope approaches 1. <clears throat> okay, and the answer is yes, because remember that the angle in that case, let me just call it the yellow angle, would have been 
with this slope would have been greater than one because it's a slope that's like approaching one from above. And in that case, by definition, we have pi over two minus capital A of the reciprocal slope. And notice that the reciprocal slope is going to be less than one and positive. And it's going to be approaching one as well, but from below. Right? Because if the original slope approaches one from above, then its reciprocal is going to be less than one, but also approaching one. So in other words, this angle here is going to be approaching pi over four from below. <clears throat> but then what happens to the entire expression? Pi over two minus that angle. Well, if that angle is getting close to pi over four, then when you subtract it from pi over two, it's also going to be getting close to pi over four. But notice that that's happening from above now. So the, the limit is, again, pi over four, which is the correct limit that we want. That's the continuity value. And it's just interesting to note that it, this time it approaches pi over four from above, which makes perfect sense because the yellow angle is greater than pi over four. And it's going to be approaching pi over four from above. Okay, so we have continuity on both sides <clears throat> of that special ray at 45 degrees. So we also um, want to do the same thing like for this ray here. This ray at 90 degrees, that is the ray from the origin through the point i. We want to give it an angle measure. And we've already sort of done that. We know that, e, that i rather can be written as e to the i pi over two. So the angle measure in that case is pi over two. Okay, now, should we therefore define a of something as pi over 2 to account for that ray? Well, not really, because the something that goes in here would be the slope. And the problem is that the slope is undefined on that ray because it's a vertical ray. So there is no slope. But you see, in some sense, we can do it, because if you think about the graph of the arctan function, it has a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2, and also at minus pi over 2, because it looks like this. Okay, so in some sense, so if I stop at any finite value of t, then no matter how, t, how large t is, even if t is a very, very big number, let's say much, much greater than 1, that's a symbol, by the way, this double greater than sign. It doesn't have any precise mathematical meaning. It's just used in like applied math and physics, where we have some sort of human scale sense of one number being much, much greater than another. So that's how you should interpret the symbol. It's like means much greater. But it's not a precise mathematical term. It's just a practical term. So let's say I take t much, much greater than one. So then you see that the height of the arctan function will be extremely close to pi over two, just not exactly equal to it. And I can get it as close as I like by taking t greater and greater. But now if I took t, if I could take t to be exactly plus infinity, like if I add a new element to the real number system called plus infinity, and that new element has to satisfy this rule that like if t is in the original real number system, then we count it as being less than plus infinity. So, and then you can also add an element at the other end, like a brand new element, something that's not a real number. It doesn't really matter what it is, just some mathematical object that is not already in the reals. And it obeys this rule, that any finite real number is greater than it, strictly. Okay, so if we consider that extension of the reals, that's called the extended reals, it's written like this, R with a line over it. And it, it, all it is is just the reals together with these two additional elements. Let me write this over here. So it's the reals together with these two additional elements that satisfy certain rules. For example, this is one of the rules. We just make that true by definition. We just declare that any finite real number is less than plus infinity. And that links the plus infinity object to the less than relation. And we can also link it to the plus sign, for, for instance, by declaring that for any real number t, um, t plus plus infinity is plus infinity, or t plus negative infinity is negative infinity. There's certain rules of algebra that we can extend in a natural way. <clears throat> so anyway, in the extended reals, we can ask, you know, what is the arctan of this value plus infinity? And the natural value to give this, by definition, would be the limit. So let's call, let's like define this to be the limit of arctan of t as t goes to plus infinity. And you can see what that is from the picture. It's just pi over 2. So if we consider this ray to be a ray of slope plus infinity, then you can plug in plus infinity into the capital A function and say that its value is pi over 2. But all of that is just a convention. It's just a matter of like making your notations to look a certain way. You don't need any of this. We, we can just say that capital A is undefined on that ray. Right? But anyway, we know the angle measure. We know that the angle measure, that is the measure of this angle here, is just pi over 2 because of this relation. Because I can be expressed as cosine pi over 2, <coughs> excuse me, comma sine pi over 2. Okay, but the question of continuity still arises. Like, what if I take some ray like this, whose slope is very large, large and positive, and I just allow that slope to get bigger and bigger and bigger? Okay, then that ray is going to sort of rotate toward that vertical. So what I'm saying is if the slope is t, and t is greater than 1, and it's going to plus infinity, let's say the slope's increasing without any, without any bound, so it's increasing all the way to plus infinity, well, then this red point right here is going to be approaching the point i on the unit circle. And the question is, does the angle measure approach the correct value, pi over 2? <clears throat> all right, well, we know it does, because we know that this limit here is pi over 2. Okay, well, how do we know that, actually? Do we really know that? We do, but we have to do a little work. Because you see, I, I'm sort of asserting it based on this picture. But the question is, how do I know that that picture is accurate? How do I know that this is an accurate graph of the arctan function? Okay, so it's not, it's not too bad. Let's remember that when t is greater than 1, a of t is just pi over 2 minus a of 1 over t, by definition. Okay, so the question then goes like this. What if I let t now go to plus infinity? In other words, it gets very, very large and positive. Well, clearly then 1 over t is going to be going to 0. And it's going, it's going to 0 from above through positive values. And that's because if t is positive, then so is its reciprocal. So the question really is, what happens to the capital A function if its input goes to 0 through positive values? If I have capital A of, let's say, I'll call it something else like S, and I let S go to zero through positive values, can I say what happens to this function? Okay, well, if you look at the definition of it, since S is going to zero, on its way to zero, it's certainly going to have to be in that interval. In fact, it's positive or non-negative because it's approaching zero from above. But you see, because it's getting close to zero and staying close to zero, eventually it will be in this interval here. So we can use this series expansion. Okay, and you, you can see that the only reasonable guess that we can make for what the limit is as S goes to zero would be zero because every term is approaching zero. 
Now, just because every term approaches zero, that doesn't necessarily mean that the limit is zero. But in this case, it does. I claim that um, indeed a of s will approach zero. Now, we have to back that up. So let me just mark it with a question mark for now. But if we go back to this slide, because we know that one over t is going to zero from above, it will now follow from this lemma. Let's call it that um, a of one over t is going to zero. And then if we look here, this is going to approach pi over two minus zero. In other words, pi over two. So indeed, if you let t get very large and positive, arbitrarily large and positive, then a of t, which is the angle associated with that slope, is going to approach pi over two. And by the way, it's approaching from below because this quantity here is a positive quantity that we're subtracting from pi over two. So it's like approaching pi over two from below. And that, <clears throat> that gives the sense of continuity in this picture. The angle to this red ray here is going to get closer and closer to pi over two as that red ray approaches that black ray, the vertical. So we get the correct continuity. And of course, the same thing will happen down here. If, you, if I have a ray whose slope is approaching negative infinity, then the angle to that ray is going to approach minus pi over two. Okay, because minus pi over two is the angle at negative i, as you can easily check. So I'll just leave you uh, to just check that this is correct. OK, anyway. Um, yeah, we left, I left this lemma open here. So, okay, how do I know that this uh, really works? All right, well, we've seen the argument now, like, many, many times, so it's going to be very easy. The basic argument is that because s is between 0 and 1, its powers decrease. And they're, they're all, of course, all positive. But they form, like, a decreasing sequence of positive numbers. Okay. And then also, for, for instance, s cubed is already less than s, and if I divide it by 3, it's even smaller. Right? And then that is, in turn, s to the fifth is smaller than s cubed. Therefore, one third s to the fifth is smaller than one third of s cubed. But then one fifth of s to the fifth is even smaller than that. So you see that the terms in this series are all positive terms. The individual terms are positive, but they're decreasing. They're decreasing in magnitude. S is the greatest of them. The next term, s cubed over 3, is a little bit less than s. s to the fifth over 5 is less than that. And they're all positive. I don't know why I wrote it that way. <laughs> um, and so on and so on. And notice that the series is alternating. Well, what that means is that I can just group these two terms, and you see that you have a negative group. Then I'll group the next two and I'll have a negative group. So that, that tells you that a of s is less than s. Because it, or less than or equal to, anyway. So s, s could be 0. So the best I can say is less than or equal, because when, in the case when s is 0, then all the terms are 0, and then these two will be exactly equal. But yeah, a of s is, is basically s minus a positive number, which is the, this group, minus another positive number, which is the next group, minus another. So it's less than or equal to s. Okay. But on the other hand, it's also positive or non-negative, because you can group the other way. You can group these two together, and that's a positive group. And then the next two is a positive group. So a of s is a sum of positive terms, or non-negative terms. So you see, once we see this inequality, then um, if s is going to 0 from above, you use the squeeze theorem. You have 0 on one side, and then the other side is going to 0. So that, therefore, a of s is also going to 0. And that, fully proves the lemma. Okay, so with it, proves the continuity um, at the point i. And by analogy, also at the point minus i. OK, then the last step is what happens on the left-hand side of the y-axis. And what, as I mentioned, if, if you have a z on that side, let's say, again, x plus i y, where the equation of the unit circle is satisfied, okay, but this time x is negative. You see, we've already taken care of all other cases, including the case where um, x is equal to 0, which is at i and negative i. Those are the only two points on the unit circle where x, the x-coordinate is 0. And we also have taken care of all cases where the x-coordinate is positive on this side. The only thing remaining to be done is to take care of cases where the x-coordinate is negative on the left-hand side of the y-axis. OK, and so remember the strategy there was to consider the uh, point reflection of that point z through the origin. In other words, we're going to consider the point negative z. Now notice that negative z is minus x plus i times minus y. And so its real part, negative x, is positive because x itself is negative. So right, minus x is now positive. So that brings us back to a case that we already know how to handle. That is, we can write negative z in the form e to the i times some angle. Okay? And what is that angle? Well, it's capital A of the slope. And if you think about the slope, the slope of this ray here, okay, but I'm calling it a ray because I mean you start at the origin and you go through the point. Well, the slope of that ray is just um, negative y over negative x, right? Because it's like negative y minus zero at the origin, and then negative x minus a zero at the origin, rise over run. But then the two minus signs cancel out also. And so we can express that slope in simplest form as y over x. And that's also the slope of this other ray. Okay, that's hardly surprising. That's also the slope of this other ray that starts at the origin and goes this way through, through the original z. Hardly surprising because actually the slope is just the slope of that line. Those two rays are both on that line. So they share in the slope of that line. Right? The two opposite rays that form that line both have that same slope of that, of that same line. So anyway, but the slope it goes here. And we know that this is a correct expression because we know that we're on the right-hand side of the uh, y-axis. And in every case, on the right-hand side of the y-axis, we know that this is the correct expression for z, uh, for the point. It happens to be negative z in this particular case. But whatever point on the unit circle you're looking at, as long as it's on the right-hand side of the y-axis, then this is the correct expression for it, where the slope is the slope of that ray from the origin through that point. Okay. Well, if that's minus z, then we can pretty easily find z. Right? We now know that minus z can be expressed this way. What about z itself? Okay, well, z is then the negative of that. But we, want, we would like to express this in the form of an exponential. And the, the trick is to express the factor negative 1 as um, an exponential. Okay, we know how to do that. We know from a prior video that e to the pi i is, is minus 1. That's what we call the most, the most beautiful formula in mathematics. Okay, so we can express that negative 1 in the form e to the pi i. And then we can combine the two. Uh, to combine the two exponents by adding them. And that expresses the original point z which was on the left-hand side of the y-axis, in the form e to the i theta. Okay. Now, there is still the question of continuity. 
<clears throat> because what I would like to have happen, um, so let me, let me label the picture in the following way. I'm going to pick some special points that we, whose angle measures we know, and I'll label them with their angle measures. Right? So like this point here, which is like the 45 degree point, its angle measure is pi over 4. I'll put, that, I'll put it in square brackets so to indicate that it's the angle measure of that point, or, like, the argument of that point. The argument of this point is 0. The argument of this point is, oops, minus pi over 4. Okay, the argument of this point, which is i, like this is point i, this is negative i, this is point 1. That's root 2 over 2 plus i root 2 over 2. And that's its conjugate. Okay, anyway, so like the argument, our uh, angle here would be pi over 2, and the angle here would be minus pi over 2. Okay, so I've now assigned an angle to a point like this, like on this side. And remember what the formula was for that. It was pi plus a of the slope. But I still have to worry about continuity. So what I mean by continuity is like this slope, which is y over x, let's say, could be approaching infinity. Well, actually, it would be minus infinity in this case. You see, this slope is negative. The slope of this line is negative because this line here, the green one, is falling as you move rightward. Right? If I move left to right, the line's height is falling. So its slope is actually negative. So what if I say I'm going to let that slope go to minus infinity? I'm going to let it get very large and negative. That means it's like looking like this as you move. But then the angle should be approaching pi over 2. Right? You see that I want, I want to have continuity at this point. So as I approach that point from this side, I know the angle approaches pi over 2 that way. That way. Right, let me do that in a different color, actually. If I have like a sequence of rays that are getting with very large slopes, large positive slopes, so moving this way, then the angle is approaching pi over 2. But what if I have these green ones with large negative slopes getting larger and larger and larger negative? Then those rays are approaching the positive y-axis as well, this black vertical. And so the angle should also approach pi over 2. Okay. Is that happening? Well, it is, and here's why. As y over x approaches minus infinity, what happens to a of that? If you look at a graph of the arctan, we just proved a moment ago that as you move to the positive side, the limit is pi over 2. So pi over 2 is indeed a vertical asymptote, oh, sorry, horizontal asymptote. That's what we proved here. If we let t go to plus infinity, so arbitrarily far in that direction, then the value of a of t, or the value of arctan of t, is going to come arbitrarily close to the limit pi over 2. But you see, by the same token, or, but just by using the fact that it's an odd function, right? an odd function has symmetry with respect to the origin. So if I just do a point reflection right through the origin, I'll get a point on the graph as well. So you see, by just using the fact that it's an odd function, we also are going to know that if t approaches minus infinity, so let me just uh, organize this in the following way. If t approaches plus infinity, it follows that the arctan approaches pi over 2 from below. But by symmetry, if t approaches negative infinity, it follows that a of t is going to approach negative pi over 2 from above. So we fully established these facts. And then coming back here, you see that um, since this slope is going to minus infinity, its a value is going to go to negative pi over 2 from above. And therefore, pi plus that a value is going to approach pi plus negative pi over 2. Now, pi plus negative pi over 2 is just pi over 2, and it's approaching from, from above, which makes perfect sense, right? Because I'm just adding pi. I'm taking the preceding line, taking this preceding line here, and just adding pi, essentially, to both sides. So when you shift both quantities by pi, the fact that it's approaching from above is not going to change. You're just shifting the whole thing, like rightward on the real line by pi units. So the fact that it's approaching from above is not going to change. Okay. So you see that this angle here is going to be approaching pi over two, but from above pi over two, which is exactly the behavior we want. So we get continuity at that point as well. But you see that only works when this point here that we started with gives a negative slope. What if I start with a point like this, right? Also on the left-hand side of the y-axis, but the slope is positive. See the reason why this one had a negative slope is because okay, x is negative. Coming back here, x is negative, so that you're on the left-hand side. But notice that y was positive. That was like one case we had. We had y is positive, so you're above the x-axis. And therefore, the slope of that green line here was like a positive number over a negative number. So it's negative. And then we allowed that slope to go to negative infinity. But you see that in this case, we have x negative and also y negative. <clears throat> in terms of the quadrants of the plane, that's like quadrant 3. This was how we dealt with quadrant 2. Here, though, what about quadrant 3? So there, there, the slope is positive again. And if I allow that slope to get large, you see it's going to do this. Now the slope is staying positive, but it's getting very large. So if I allow y over x now to, plus, to approach plus infinity, a of that a of that slope is going to approach pi over 2 from below. And you see that then we don't want to shift up by pi, because if I shift that up by pi, I'm going to get pi plus pi over 2 from below, which is whatever, 3 pi over 2. And that's not the angle I have here. And so to get continuity at this point, negative i, I know that from one side, from one direction, everything works. That is, if I approach that point from the right-hand side, the angle does approach negative pi over 2. And the angle is exactly negative pi over 2 at that point. But what about approaching from the other direction? I want the angle to approach minus pi over 2. But here in this case, you see that you're getting 3 pi over 2. So, OK, it's not, we're not going to shift up by pi. Instead, we're going to shift down by pi. In that case, we're going to add negative pi. And that's going to make it approach minus pi plus pi over 2 from below. And that's just exactly negative pi over 2. Okay. So you see that we have a slightly different formula. In this case, the formula for the angle is minus pi plus a of the slope. And that still works. Like Coming back to this little derivation here, that's still a fine choice because you see that it's not just e to the pi i that's equal to negative 1. Uh, where can I write this? e to the minus i pi is also negative 1. You can just explicitly check that. Um, there are several ways to think about it. You can think about it as that this is just the reciprocal of e to the pi i, or also the conjugate of it. And since you see the, oh, what am I doing? Um, sorry, e to the pi i is negative 1, right? And its conjugate is also negative 1. Or you can think of it this way. It's, the reciprocal of negative 1 is also negative 1. Okay, or you could just do it this way. You can just think of it by Euler's formula. It's the cosine of negative pi plus i times the sine of negative pi. Now, cosine is even, so we can drop the minus in there, and then sine is odd. So we can pull out the minus sign. But also we know that cosine of pi is negative 1, and sine of pi is 0. 
So we, we get a negative one. Okay? Anyway, so you see that because it was this factor of negative one that we needed to write in the form of an exponential, but we have a choice. We can either write it as e to the pi i, or we can write it as e to the negative pi i. It doesn't matter. Both are legitimate. So you see that not only do you get this expression for the for the angle, but you can also make it a negative pi plus um, a of y over x. Because again, at this stage, when I had this minus one factor here, I could have replaced that with e to the minus pi i if I, if I wanted to. That's still a correct replacement. That would have introduced a minus sign here and also a minus sign there. So it's a legitimate choice, and it's the right choice um, because of this continuity argument here. Because shifting by negative pi will give us the correct limit of minus pi over two. Um, exactly at this point. Okay, so now we have, um, ah, but see, there's one case that, that's missing right now. There's exactly one point on the unit circle that I have not dealt with, and that's the point negative one itself. Okay, because notice that in this case, I, I took y to be positive, so above the x-axis, and in this case, I took y to be negative, so below the x-axis. But what if y is zero? So you're exactly on the x-axis, but x is negative. Now, there's only one point like that. There's only one point on the unit circle whose x-coordinate is negative and whose y-coordinate is zero. See, because if you look at the equation of the unit circle, plugging in y equals zero means x squared is one, so x is zero plus or minus one, but because x is negative, x has to be minus one. So the only solution is that point. Okay, so that, that's the only point I haven't accounted for. What angle should I assign to that point? Okay, well, we can try to do it by continuity again. If I take these green rays and I let the slopes approach zero, I can ask, like, what's the limit of this formula as the slopes approach zero? And make that value the exact angle at this ray here, this leftward horizontal ray. And that's an easy thing to define, right? Because if, if the angle is pi plus this a of the slope, and if I know that the slope is approaching zero, we've already shown that a of something approaching zero also approaches zero. So this is going to approach zero, and therefore the whole angle is going to approach pi. So that's an argument for making, or here, back in this picture, that's a good argument for agreeing to say that the angle of this ray from the positive x-axis, this angle here, should be considered pi, like plus pi. But of course, you can make an equally good argument to consider it minus pi. Because instead of using oops, instead of using this formula here and taking the limit as the slopes go to zero, I could have used this formula here, and I could have taken the limit as the slopes go to zero. That would look like this, the blue slope's getting very close to zero. But then the a of the slope would be also going to zero. So the limit would be minus pi in that case. So pi and minus pi have sort of equal claim to be the argument of that leftward horizontal. But by convention, historically, we just chose pi. Right? Because pi is slightly simpler than negative pi. Between a number and its negative, you should choose the positive one as a kind of canonical value. So we're going to choose pi as the principal argument of that. Right? So anyway, putting everything together, we then have this principal argument function. So here I'm assuming that z is a complex number. And initially, let's take its absolute value to be 1, so that it's on the unit circle. <clears throat> but we can also relax that. Um, I'm sure you'll remember this, I said this previously, but we can relax that by saying, well, if I have any z different from 0, we can consider the ray through that point, and then there's a unique representative of that ray, a unique element of that ray on the unit circle, which is z over the modulus of z. So if I've assigned a principal argument to this point, because it's on the unit circle, we can also take that to be the principal argument of this point. Since after all, it's just supposed to be measuring this angle. So which point on that terminal ray you use shouldn't matter. So we're just going to define the principal argument of this z to be the same as the principal argument of that, which is on the unit circle. So there's really no loss of generality if we restrict z to be on the unit circle. Okay, well then the principal argument of z is going to be defined in the following way. There's several cases. <clears throat> okay, first of all, it's just a of y over x. Now, what I mean by x and y here are just the coordinates of z. So let's write z as, like, let's say x plus i, y, right, where x and y are real. Okay, anyway, so capital A of the slope is going to be the formula when x is positive. So you're on the right-hand side of the x-axis. Oh, and that's arctan, so I probably should write it that way now. Arctan of the slope if the x-coordinate is positive. Okay, if the x-coordinate is zero, then there are two cases. There's the case when y is plus one, so that's the point i. In other words, z is equal to i in this case. Its real part is zero, and its imaginary part is one. Okay, in that case, then the angle is pi over two. And then there's the other case when x is zero, which is the case where y is negative one. In other words, z is the point minus i. And in that case, we set the principal argument to be minus pi over two. Okay, now there's also the case where x is negative and y is positive. That's like quadrant two. Notice, by the way, that quadrants one and two, oh, sorry, quadrants one and four have been totally dealt with. Quadrants one and four, where x is positive. And not only that, but also like the, the x plus axis, positive x-axis has been dealt with as well, in this case. Because that also, like the positive x-axis is also points with positive x-coordinates. But you see, in, in that case, when you're on the positive x-axis, that means y is zero, which means the slope is zero, y over x. And arctan of zero is just zero. So the angle that the positive x-axis makes with itself is zero, which makes perfect sense. Anyway, those cases have all been covered there. All right, in quadrant two, remember we had this formula, pi plus um, arctan of the slope. And then finally, in quadrant 3, we have minus pi, plus the arctan of the slope. And that's if x is negative and y is positive. In other words, quadrant 3. Oh, sorry, y is negative. Okay, so that uh, covers all the... Oh, sorry, right? So there's one more case. There's one more case, which is the case where um, z is the point minus 1 itself. In other words, x is negative 1 and y is 0. In that case, we set the value to be pi, just by convention. It could have been set to minus pi, but by convention, it's just set to pi. Okay, so that fully defines the principal argument function. And just a couple of small facts about this function. The first thing to know about it is that its value is always in this range for all z different from zero. So that's just an important inequality to know about the principal argument function. Okay, so incidentally, um, yeah, let me just take, take a moment. 
by definition, if z is any non-zero complex number, then we define its principal argument as the principal argument of z over modulus of z, which is on the unit circle. That's like the unique representative of the ray. So for instance, let's say z is here, not on the unit circle. But then as long as it's not zero, as long as z is different from zero, you have two distinct points, and there's a unique ray uh, from zero through the point z. And then there's also a unique point on that ray that has a modulus of one. And in the prior video, we proved that that's that point. So that point is on the unit circle, and therefore it has a principal argument according to the last definition. So we just set the principal argument of z itself to be the same as the principal argument of z over modulus of z, because we're just measuring this angle. So it really makes no difference where that point is on that green ray. Now notice that this definition is like self-consistent in the case where z happens to have a modulus of one. Right? If it happens that, z, that the modulus of z is one, just by chance, then all the, this equation will just reduce to saying that argz equals argz, because the, the denominator is a one. So it's consistent. It's a consistent extension of the principal argument concept. Okay. So, But note carefully that arg of zero is undefined. That's the only point in the plane that doesn't have a principal argument, is the origin itself. Okay. Simply because um, there's no ray that we can draw from the origin through the origin. There's no unique ray. So then we can't like, intersect the unit circle with a ray. Okay, so arg zero is undefined, but arg of anything else is, is perfectly well defined. And then the principal arg is always between minus pi and pi, and it can take the value pi, whereas it cannot take the value minus pi. You see that it can take the value pi simply because we put pi in here as one of its values. That happens when z is negative one, the leftmost point on the unit circle. But you can check that all the other values are between minus pi and pi strictly. Like in all the other cases besides that one, the value of arg z is always like strictly between negative pi and pi. It's clear that these values are strictly between negative pi and pi. And then you also can check that in, all, in these cases too, the values are strictly between negative pi and pi. Okay, the, the key observation is just that arctan is always, arctan of anything, t, is strictly between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, by the way we defined it. Remember its graph. It's strictly between its values, lie strictly between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Strictly, because um, the curve is asymptotic to these and never reaches them. Okay? So, yeah, that's like the key inequalities you need. And if you come back here, you, you'll see that, um, for example, like in quadrant 2, in the case of quadrant 2, the slope here is negative, because x and y have opposite signs, and then if you look at the arctan on the negative side, when the sl slope is negative, the arctan is actually between 0 and minus pi over 2. So you're going to have even better inequality. When the slope t is negative, then the arctan of that slope is going to actually be between negative pi over 2 and 0. That is in here. Okay, anyway, so what, um, what that means is that if I add pi to everything... Oh, I'm sorry. This should be a minus. Okay, you add pi to everything, what you get is these bounds. And certainly that's between negative pi and pi. So yeah, the, the angle in that case is also strictly between minus pi and pi. That's the case of um, quadrant two. And you can also do the same reasoning for quadrant three and also for, for this case here. In all the cases, obey those bounds. So this is a correct theorem. Oops. All right, and the culmination of all of this, which is the beginning of this topic of polar coordinates, is this theorem here. That for any z in the complex plane different from zero, we can express z as a positive real number which I'm also going to call r, multiplied by a point on the unit circle, cosine of a certain angle. Um, okay, what is that angle? Okay, let me slow it down a little bit. I'm going to write it like this, just for brevity. But you see, the, the modulus of z is some positive real number, r. And then e to the i times an angle is nothing but cosine of that angle, comma sine of that angle. So if I call the angle theta, then you have that. And then you can put the factor r inside both coordinates. So we can express any arbitrary point in the complex plane, any point at all, other than the origin. The only restriction is that z should not be the origin. We can express it in the form r cos theta, comma, r sine theta, where r is by definition the modulus of z, which is positive, and theta is by definition the principal argument of z. Okay? So um, in going from this step to this step, I've just used Euler's formula. Instead of writing it as a complex exponential, e to the i theta, I've just written it as cos theta plus i sine theta, in other words, the point cos theta, comma, sine theta, because that's more traditional like, geometry notation. But you see that um, what this is telling you is that every point in the plane, other than the origin, has an expression in the form r cos theta, comma, r sine theta, where r is a positive real number, and then theta is just some real number. <clears throat> okay, and those, those two numbers, r and theta, are called the polar coordinates. The pair r-theta, and we're going to mark it with a p for polar, we call these the polar coordinates of the point z. So you see that z has two types of coordinates now. It has rectangular coordinates, which are x and y. We can express z in terms of its rectangular coordinates. We call them rectangular because like, they refer to a um, grid, they refer to like perpendicular axes. Well, anyway, um, we'll get to more of that when we study polar coordinates in their own right. But um, yeah, as for the proof of this formula, it's very simple. In fact, we already sort of know it. Um, I'm gonna have to erase this. Let me just erase some of this because I'm out of slides on this one. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's easy. It's just, if we have any point z that's not equal to zero, any complex number, we can look at the point w, which is z over the modulus of z. And we know that that has a modulus of one. So in other words, it's on the unit circle. Okay, now being on the unit circle, we can express it in the form e to the i theta, where theta is the principal argument of w. Right, that's what we just got through proving, is that in every one of those cases, let me find a picture of that. Yeah, like in this case here, like for every point on the unit circle, we assigned an angle 
which are these uh, numbers in the square brackets. Okay, and what these angles represent, yeah, so maybe I kind of left out a case, like a typical point on the on this side has angle A of y over x. Anyway, what these numbers represent is just the value of theta that, that satisfies this equation. So if the given point is z, then we can always write z in this form where theta is real. And the solution for theta, given z, is always the principal argument. Just by the way we defined the principal argument. If we look at the definition here, we always defined it as the as that angle, whatever that angle is. Like in quadrants 1 and 4, or on the positive x-axis, the angle was capital A of y over x. Right? On the uh, positive y-axis, the angle is pi over 2. On the negative y-axis, the angle is negative pi over 2, okay, and so on and so on. So the, by definition of the principal argument, the principal argument in every one of these cases is the angle theta such that z can be expressed as e to the i theta. So that's a way of understanding what the principal argument is. It's just the value of theta such that the given point can be expressed in the form e to the i theta. Okay? Now since w is on the unit circle, we can always take the principal argument of w and call it theta, and then we can use that to express w in this form, e to the i theta. So in other words, that gives us this equation. Right? Now we know that w is z over the modulus of z, and we also know that the argument of z is the same as the argument of w, principal argument. Because let's remember that the way we defined the principal argument, we just defined it so that the principal argument of any point, except for the origin, is equal by definition to the principal argument of that point over its own modulus, which in our case is exactly w, by definition of w, right? So argz and rw are the same, and therefore I can just replace this argw with this argz, right? And then finally we just multiply through by the modulus of z, which is in the denominator, and that gives us um, the numerator z by itself, so we put the modulus of z on the other side, okay? And then of course if you like you can express this in the form cosine of argz plus i times sine of argz. I don't have quite enough room to write it, but you see and then the, the modulus of z has to distribute and ends up in both terms, okay? Uh, now it's standard to abbreviate the modulus of z as r, and then it's pretty standard to also just use the letter theta for the principal argument. So you see that we're basically just writing the point z as r cosine theta plus i times r sine theta, or in coordinate form, r cosine theta comma r sine theta. Okay, so what that gives us is a conversion formula between the rectangular coordinates and the polar coordinates. Okay, to be more precise, the polar coordinates are r and theta. We mark it with a little p to tell us that we don't do this. We don't measure r units this way and then theta units this way. That's not the way we get the point z. These are not rectangular coordinates, they're polar coordinates. And so what that means is that r is the distance to the origin. So we first draw a circle of radius r. Center of the origin. And then theta gives the ray. You, you, what you do is you make a ray that makes an angle of theta radians with the positive x axis. Like in that direction. From the positive x toward that ray is theta, theta radians. And then the intersection point of those two is the point with these polar coordinates. But what are the rectangular coordinates of that point? And the answer is given by this theorem. The rectangular coordinates are the x coordinate is r cosine theta and the y coordinate is r sine theta. So if we call the rectangular coordinates x and y, we have these two formulas that relate x and y to r and theta. We can think of this as conversion from polar to rectangular. Because if we know the values of r and theta, you can plug them in. Right? Let's say r is known and theta is known. Then you can just plug them in using a known function, cosine, and you'll get the value of x. Right? Similarly, you'll get the value of y. So this is what you would use if you know the polar coordinates and you wish to get the rectangular coordinates. Okay, now we can also go back. We can um, convert in the other direction as well. r is just the modulus of z. Remember that z is the point xy. So we know how to calculate the modulus of that. It's the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then theta is just the principal argument of z. Okay, that has its own formula, which is sort of too lengthy to write out. It's this formula here. It has a number of cases, right? How many cases does it have? One, two, three, four, five, six cases. <clears throat> but in each case, we have like either an explicit value, like pi over two, or if not an explicit value, some formula that we can compute because we know how to compute the arctan function using a series. So anyway, although I can't write the full like six case formula here, we know what it is. We have a record of it, and we can regard this, these two formulas, as giving us conversion from xy to r theta. So if we know the rectangular coordinates, we can use them to calculate the polar coordinates. Right? So we can think that there are two coordinate systems for the plane, rectangular and polar, and we have a way of converting back and forth between the two. Okay, now we're going to start studying this polar coordinate system in its own right, starting in the next video. And it turns out that, you know, the equations of certain curves become very natural and um, short and elegant in the polar coordinate system, whereas they would be horribly complicated in the rectangular coordinate system. See, rectangular coordinates are very good for certain kinds of curves, like parabolas in standard position, y equals x squared, very simple equation. Okay, but if you, there's certain other curves that arise naturally in mathematics, um, such as a cardioid, which is like a kind of heart-shaped curve, um, or a lemnus gate, or a tractrix. There are various sort of classical curves that came up in the, in the history of geometry. Um, which were used by the ancient Greek geometers to perform certain constructions, such as trisecting an angle. It's well known that you cannot trisect a given angle. Like if, I, if I give you some angle in the plane, it's impossible to construct the two angle trisectors using just a compass and a straight edge. But if you have this curve called a tractrix, then you can do it. If you're given like a printout of a tractrix, you can use it to construct the two angle trisectors of an arbitrary given angle. So anyway, there are various things. And various of these classical curves have much simpler descriptions in polar coordinates than they do in rectangular coordinates. So it's a useful coordinate system in that, in that regard. Um, especially when some sort of when a problem, like let's say in physics, there are many problems in physics that involve symmetry about a point. So for example, you might have you know, gravitational problem where the gravitating body is regarded as a point mass at the center at the origin, and then you have a body that's being acted upon by that gravitational force kind of moving in an orbit around that fixed origin. So for example, the planetary orbits, you can regard the sun as fixed at the origin. And let's say a planet is just moving around, around it under the influence of gravity. But because the gravitational field is spherically symmetric around the gravitating body, around the sun, then um, see problems that have spherical symmetry or circular symmetry are probably better treated in polar coordinates than in rectangular coordinates. Okay. Anyway, so polar coordinates are, are useful and interesting, and they're going to be used a lot in calculus when you study calculus. So um, in our next couple of videos, we will talk about the use of polar coordinates, how we can write down the equations of certain curves, 
in polar coordinates, how we can analyze the symmetries of a curve, like if it has symmetry over one of the two axes or something like that, just by looking at its polar equation. Okay, everyone, so I apologize for the length of this video. There was a lot to cover. But now we've totally um, dealt with trig in a rigorous way. And notice that we've done both ordinary trig in terms of sine, cosine, tangent, and also we've done inverse trig, the, the arctan function, or inverse tangent. And, you know, you can think about this yourself if you like, but the, the, the inverse sine, or arc sine, and also the inverse cosine, or arc cosine, they can both be defined in terms of the arctangent. So the arctangent is sort of the basis for all of inverse trigonometry. You should look into this um, if you have a little time. Try to either find for yourself, or just look into it, and figure out how to define the arc sine of a value between minus 1 and 1. You can define it in terms of the arctan somehow. You have, you have to define it as like arctan of something. And that something is going to be some function of x. And the goal is to get a quantity such that the sine of it is just x. You, you want to find some quantity such that when you take its sine, it gives you back x. Okay, so you have to sort of relate sine and tangent. Because remember, the arctan has the property that the tan of the arctan of t is t. So you can play around with this. You can try to like take, take the sine of the arctan somehow, using this relation. See if you can figure out the sine of the arctan. Because after all, the tangent is nothing but the sine over the cosine. So what, what this is telling you here is that like sine of arctan of t over cosine of arctan of t is t. And then you also know another relationship between the two, which is that the sine, the numerator squared plus the denominator squared is equal to 1. So you can think of it as like two equations and two unknowns. You know the ratio of the two is, t is equal to t, and you know that the sum of their squares is equal to 1. So see if you can solve for this one. Okay, and then you'll figure out uh, what you need. So then, then you'll have some expression in here involving x. And you can just define the arc sine of x to be that quantity, that expression arctan of something. Okay, but the goal should be to get this identity to be true for all values of x between minus 1 and 1 inclusive. And you can do similarly for arc cosine. You can do similarly for the expression arc cosine of x. That's also going to be defined as arctan of something. But you have to figure out what the something is. All right, so basically we have a rigorous foundation now for all of trig and also all of inverse trig. And we have a starting point for polar coordinates. We have a rigorous theorem here. I'm going to call this theorem the polar form theorem. Okay, the polar form theorem because it gives the polar form of an arbitrary point in the plane uh, other than the origin. Take any point in the plane different from the origin. And, that, and this helps you express that point in polar form, which is r cosine theta comma r sine theta. It tells you what the r is, namely the modulus of the point, and also tells you what the theta is, namely the principal argument of the point. Okay, so anyway, that's the um, starting point for this next topic. And in the next video, we'll get into that topic in its own right. So see you guys next time.